Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, virtual council meeting for August 23rd and this beautiful sunny evening. Uh, call the meeting to order, and we'll start off by adopting the agenda. So I have a recommendation here that the agenda for the August 23rd, 2021 regular meeting of council be accepted and passed. Could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by Lisa. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Um, next, uh, any disclosure of pecuniary interest on anything on tonight's agenda? Uh, we'll go through this again for the Committee of Adjustment and Public Meeting, but this pertains to the Council meeting agenda. I have nothing to declare in terms of pecuniary interest, uh, Councillor Yake? No. Councillor Burke? No. Councillor Hearn? No. Councillor McCabe? I have none. Okay, thank you. So right, uh, right away, we will <clears throat> recess the Council meeting move into the public meeting. We have uh, a minor variance to deal with and two zoning amendments, public meetings to uh, to participate with as well. So with that, I'll make a recommendation here that we uh, um, recess the council meeting. Uh, the recommendation is that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North recess the August 23rd, 2021 regular meeting of council for the purpose of holding a public meeting under the Planning Act. For Carlot Farms Inc. Minor Variants, Archicon Group Inc. Zoning Amendment, and Little Rest Farms Inc. Zoning Amendment. Can I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Sherry, seconded by Dan. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So I believe we start with the uh, Committee of Adjustment meeting. So I'll just switch my paperwork around here. And I'll call the Committee of Adjustment meeting for August 23rd to order. And again, I'll ask for disclosure of pecuniary interest. And this is in regard to the public meeting agenda for uh, application A12 slash 21. Uh, I have no pecuniary interest to declare. Councillor Hearn? No. Councillor Burke? No. Councillor Yates? No. And Councillor McCabe? I have none. Okay, thank you. So we'll deal with the minutes of the previous uh, Committee of Adjustment meeting from July 12th. We have a recommendation here that the Committee of Adjustment meeting minutes of July 12th, 2021, applications A10 slash 21 and A11 slash 21 be adopted as presented. Did I get a mover and a seconder for that? Moved by Councillor McCabe. Seconded by Councillor Hearn. Any discussion on those minutes? Okay, all those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Our application for tonight is A12 slash 21 for Carlot Farms, Inc. Um, location of the subject property is described as East Part Lot 34, Concession 1, and is municipally known as 7538 First Line. Pro property is approximately 32.37 hectares in size, and the location of the property is shown on the map in your agenda package. Purpose and effect of the application is to provide relief from the minimum interior side yard. The applicant is proposing to construct a new 1,913.8 meter squared shed. Relief is requested to permit the new, a new shed with interior side yard of 6.09 meters. Other variances may be considered where deemed appropriate. How was notice given for this public meeting? Notices were mailed to property owners within 60 meters of the subject property and to the applicable agencies. Signage was posted on the property on August 10th, 2021. Great, thank you. Uh, presentation, who's doing the presentation for this one tonight? Uh, Matt, myself. Okay, I don't know if you thanks. See me on the Matt. Screen well, there, but welcome. I see you now. Perfect. And uh, yes, good evening. So thank you, and for you, Chair. Before you today is a minor variance application to provide relief from the interior side yard setback for an accessory structure. The applicant is proposing to construct a 
20,600 square foot drive shed with a 20 foot um, setback from the interior lot line, whereas the bylaw requires a 60 foot uh, setback. So the applicant has indicated the proposed location would provide operational efficiency um, and, 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 and is part of their succession planning with regards to all some other structures uh, currently and sort of proposed for the property as well. Um, so with that said, planning staff have no concerns with the application as the request is minor, meets the intent of the official plan and zoning bylaw, and I welcome any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, we're on to correspondence for committee's review. We have the one from Wellington Source Water Protection from Emily Vandermeulen. Has any further correspondence been received in respect to this application? No, we have not received anything else. Okay. So we're, when we get to the decision, any person wishing to be notified of the decision must submit a written request to the Secretary Treasurer of the Committee of Adjustment. And with that, I'll open the floor for any questions or comments uh, from the public. Do we have anyone registered to speak on this application, Karen? Uh, Carl Brubacher is uh, in as a participant. Uh, he doesn't have his camera on. I'm thinking he has his microphone on, but uh, I'm not sure, Carl, if you're wanting to speak. Okay, Carl, do you wish to speak to the app, your application? Okay, I'm not hearing him, so I think for now we'll go on. Um, any questions or comments from the committee? Uh, Steve, go ahead. Uh, through you, Mayor, just uh, a quick question I'm in favor of this. Uh, I just wonder why they have to go that close to the lot line when they could pull it a little bit further south. It was just a, a, a you have been looking at the uh, aerial photo, um, Matthew, and it looks like they could have pulled it a little bit further south and not really had this uh, amendment. Are you able to help us with that, Matthew? So Carl is connecting to something. He's just He's trying to get on here, so go ahead, Matt. Okay. Yes, through you, Chair. Uh, so I did have a discussion with the applicant today. I did give him a call, um, and perhaps hopefully he connects and he can sort of give you the firsthand um, sort of answer here, but sort of providing details between the lines here. Um, he, he did advise me that it, it does provide operational efficiency. They do plan to sort of um, have the capability to drive through both ends um, with some of their equipment and with regards to uh, some of the winds as well as noise, they're looking to sort of mitigate um, sort of both of those things. Um, and, and he felt that the 20 feet sort of worked best for, for everything. And that was sort of what was conveyed to me over the phone today. Um, I'm not sure if Carl's connected here yet, but if, if he wants to sort of add more, that's, that was my understanding. Okay. He says he's still trying to connect. Okay. Thank you, and that's literally, uh, sorry again through you, Mayor Lennox, sorry, that's all I kind of wanted to know. Just, it looked like they had the room for it, but if they uh, need the room on both sides of the uh, north and south end of the uh, shed, that's, that's quite all right. Thank you. Okay, any other questions or comments from committee? Hey everyone, I'm here now, I think. Okay. Hi, Carol. Welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, did you have any comments you wanted to make in regard to your application, Carol? I know that uh, we did have a question with why you need to be so close to the property line, and Matthew valiantly uh, tried to give us the answer, but if you'd like to make any comments, uh, feel free. Yeah, Matthew, job well done. Uh, we put a lot of time and thought into into this proposal. Um, yeah, there's gonna be drive through on the uh, on the south side. So it's gonna be, you know, best land use. The back corner, if we move further away from the fence line, basically a dead area, potentially up in weeds. And like Matt mentioned, we're trying to, you know, it's kind of a unique way the building's placed in there, but again, a lot of thought put into it because of what, uh, is only about 300 meters away from from our property, so uh, we're pretty excited about it and think it's 
it's going to be really nice when completed. And we also want to have some yard at the uh, south southeast end, which if we need to move the whole building sideways, puts us out into the field versus keeping it uh, kind of tidied up in the building area. Okay. I'll just uh, ask the committee if they have any other questions in regard to the application. Well, thank you, Carl. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Okay, then we'll move to the decision here. So I get to, I'll read the decision, then we'll vote on it. Uh, that the minor variance applied for an application A12 slash 21 for the property described as East Part Lot 34, Concession 1, and is municipally known as 7538 First Line to provide the following relief that an interior side yard minimum of 6.09 meters be permitted for a proposed new accessory structure, whereas the bylaw requires 18.3 meters. Okay, all those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So that's uh, approved. That brings us to the end of our Committee of Adjustment meeting for tonight. So we have a recommendation here to adjourn the Committee of Adjustment meeting and that recommendation reads that the Committee of Adjustment meeting of August 23rd, 2021 be adjourned. Could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Dan, seconded by Lisa. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. We are adjourned from the Committee of Adjustment meeting. We'll now move over to the public meeting for the zoning bylaw amendments. And with that said, I will uh, call a public meeting uh, to order at uh, 7, 12 p.m. And we'll go through again the disclosure of pecuniary interest routine in regard to tonight's application, application 19 slash 21 Archicon Group Inc, 773 Princess Street and application 21 slash 21 Little Rest Farms Inc at 8619 Side Road 7. I have no pecuniary interest in regard to this Applications, uh, Councillor McCabe. I have none, Mayor. Mayor. Okay, uh, Councillor Burke. No. Councillor Yake. No. Councillor Hearn. No. Okay, so we'll start with application E or sorry, ZBA nineteen slash twenty one. This is the Archcon Group Inc. application. The location of the subject land, the land subject to the proposed amendment is described as part of park lot nine, registered plan 61R7008, uh, part, part one, and is municipally known as 773 Princess Street, geographic town of Mount Forest. The property is 0 0.64 hectares in size and is currently vacant. Of course, the uh, location is shown on the map in your agenda package. Purpose and effect of this application. Purpose and effect of the proposed amendment is to rezone the subject land from medium density residential R2 zone to high density residential R3 zone to facilitate the construction of a 32 unit, two story apartment building. Additional relief may be considered at this meeting. How is notice given for this public meeting? Notices were mailed to property owners within 120 meters as well as to the applicable agencies and signage was posted on the property on July 26, 2021. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have uh, a couple of presentations here for this application. First, uh, Jessica, welcome Jessica. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. So tonight we've been brought here for the public meeting for a zoning and bylaw amendment application that has been submitted by um, been submitted to the township to rezone the lands located at 773 Princess Street in Mount Forest from medium density residential R2 zone to a high density residential R3 zone in order to permit the construction of a 32 unit two story apartment building on a vacant 1.6 acre lot. So currently the subject property is designated residential in the county official plan and zoned medium density residential R2 zone. Um, my report to Council has provided an overview of the planning policies uh, from the provincial policy statement, the growth plan, the county official plan, and the Wellington North Community Growth Plan in relation to the zoning bylaw amendment application that was submitted. 
Um, from staff's initial view, review, the proposed apartment is consistent with the PPS, the growth plan, and the county official plan. So staff has attached a draft bylaw uh, for public review and council consideration. Uh, the purpose of the public meeting is to provide an overview of the proposed zoning bylaw amendment and provide the opportunity for the community and residents to ask questions and seek uh, information from the applicant. Um, there's already been some concerns that have, have been raised by local residents through the notification process so far. Um, so staff will be listening to any additional concerns brought forward uh, in addition to the letters that have already been provided uh, to the local township. Um, and we will consider everything in addition with uh, the site plan approval process as well for any other concerns. Uh, we also have the applicant and the planning consultant here tonight um, that have prepared a presentation and we will hopefully be able to provide further clarification on some of the concerns that have already been raised. And we will also be here if staff or council have any other further questions. Okay, thanks, Jessica. Do we have uh, Andrea Sinclair with us tonight? Yes, we do. Karen? Good evening, everyone. I've been having lots okay. of technical difficulties this afternoon, so hopefully I can share a screen successfully. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail about the proposed application. And as Jessica mentioned, there's a few things that um, have already been adjusted as a result of some of the uh, feedback received. Is everyone seeing that okay on their screens? Okay. Yeah, looks good to me. Great, so my name's Andrea Sinclair. I'm a planner and partner with MHBC Planning. We've been retained by the property owner um, to review the merits of the proposal that's before you this evening. Uh, we've got a project team that's been assembled to deal with all um, technical uh, considerations and that's the owner Archcon group and then Rangers and law which provides architectural engineering services and myself and Jillian at MHPC who have done the planning review uh, members of our project team are all watching this evening so that they can hear all the comments uh, firsthand as they come in from the public and as well as questions or comments from Council uh, as Jessica mentioned, the application or the property is located at 773 Princess Street. Uh, it's a vacant site. Um, there was a previous commercial use on the property that's now been demolished. Uh, it's with low properties located within proximity of a number of key services and amenities, including um, parks, recreation complex, the Louise Marshall Hospital, downtown Mount Forest, and grocery and convenience stores. Uh, surrounding properties are all residential in nature and there's a mix of townhomes, single detached and semi-detached units within the immediate surrounding area. Uh, this photo shows the site from Princess Street and what you can see in the background of this photo is the previous three-story commercial uh, use that was on the property as well as a number of transport trucks. Uh, as I mentioned that that building has now been demolished. The proposed building is uh, two stories and is going to be located further from the property lines than this uh, previous use. And in our opinion, uh, the proposed residential use is a more compatible use of these lands than the um, previous commercial use that was located on these properties. Uh, the development proposal is for a two story uh, purpose built rental apartment building. Um, that's a really key consideration of this proposal is that it is intended to be provide rental housing, which is, um, you know, really lacking in the area and it's proposed to main, be maintained as rental uh, professionally man, maintained uh, and it's not the intent that this will be condo and sold off. We do think there really is a need for um, attainable rental housing in Mount Forest. Uh, heights being limited to two stories and there's 48 parking spaces proposed on site for the 32 units. Uh, the site is going to be fully compliant with the R3 zone that's proposed. Uh, one thing I did want to mention is that the as of right zoning on the property. Um, uh, she's the person, the building person for this. Me? 
Sorry? I think I someone think was just on mute. That's okay. Okay, okay sorry. Go, go um, ahead, Andrea. Thank you. Um, so what I wanted to mention is the existing R2 zone permits a range of residential housing types, including townhouses and fourplexes. Uh, at a maximum height of 10 and a half meters. We're proposing the R3 zone in order to add the apartment use. Um, however, we're not seeking out the maximum permissions of the R3 zone. So for example, we could go up to 12, story, 12 meters in height uh, and the official plan would allow up to 48 units, but we are uh, pursuing 32 units and a reduced height um, from what that R3 zone would otherwise permit. Uh, there's amenity space proposed both on the ground and in the form of balconies for each of the individual units. Um, the building will be uh, accessible, so second story apartments will be accessed. They can get access through elevators that will be proposed. Uh, it's going to increase the range of supply of housing types in the area and we think is going to result in an attractive high quality development um, that's going to be a real enhancement to the neighborhood. Uh, just in terms of timelines for those watching at home, uh, we had an informal pre-submission back in April. The applications were submitted at the end of June. Uh, we're now at the statutory public meeting and we understand that staff will be considering everything heard tonight before this comes back for council decision. I've already really gone through this, I'm gonna skip. Um, I wanted to take some time on the actual site plan concept. A number of the comments that were attached to the development or to the agenda for this evening talk about uh, a number of things that were on an older version of the plan and have now been addressed um, through this version of the plan that's included in the planning report and it's submitted as part of the application. So uh, the previous version of this plan, the driveway was not centered and there was a discussion about a consent to have a single detached lot created on Princess Street. That's no longer the case. Um, it is the intent to uh, have a driveway centered on the property and allow for landscaping on either side of that driveway. The driveway has been proposed at a width that is suitable for both ways of uh, traffic coming in and out of the site. As well, there was a number of concerns about the side yard setback um, that goes against the rear yard of the properties that face onto Jeremy Street. The earlier um, version of this plan, there was about a 10 foot side yard. That's been increased to just over 20 feet. Um, and so some of the uh, members of the public who provided comments may not have been aware that these changes were made. So I just wanted to raise that and bring that to everyone's attention. Um, through the site plan process, our client has confirmed that they are uh, willing to, prepare, uh, to provide a brand new privacy fence along the entire perimeter of the property. And there's also opportunities um, in terms of privacy concerns that have been raised now with um, over 20 feet uh, along the side yard. There's the ability to plant a number of trees and those will be strategically placed to allow for um, some screening kind of between the two, uh, the new building and existing development in the area. Uh, I'm not going to get really too in detail over the policy, um, as Jessica has already confirmed. Uh, this proposal is fully in alignment with provincial policy as well as local policy. Uh, the lands are already permitted at a density that would allow 48 units on the site. As I mentioned, um, we're proposing 32 units. One thing that I did want to um, raise this evening, and if it's something that is um, palatable to council and members of the public is we're willing to build in some site specific provisions to the zoning to give the public the assurance that we're not going to come in at site plan and suddenly add additional stories or units so we would be willing to cap the height um, to the height that's already permitted in the r2 zone which is 10.5 meters and we'd also be willing to add provisions that cap the number of units to the 32 that are proposed um, the the plan that's before Council today um, is really what we are intending on going forward with. We don't have any plans to add anything additional once the zoning is in place. Um, we think it's going to be a wonderful addition to the neighborhood and at two stories, um, we believe it's quite compatible with surrounding development. As I mentioned, um, the previous three story building was much closer to the property lines. Um, this, this proposal provides more, uh, exceeds the zoning setbacks and um, will allow for landscaping as a buffer between. 
just going through some of the renderings here, and just to give an idea of what the building will look like. And I'm not sure if I have a time limit this evening, so I've gone pretty quickly, but um, in conclusion, in our opinion, the proposed amendment conforms to the provincial policy framework and aligns with the county's OP and the township's uh, growth plan. The use is already permitted by the official plan and this, uh, the purpose of the zone change is really just to add residential um, apartments to the site at um, a heightened density that we feel is appropriate for the area. And I'm here to answer any questions that council may have. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Andrea. Stay tuned. We may get back to you. Thanks. Uh, before we move on to the next section, I just wanted to provide a little bit of context to the process here. So tonight we're dealing with the public meeting for the zoning bylaw amendment, but there's a number of other steps that uh, happen in an application such as this. Um, in this particular case, because it was previously commercial use, it had to go through an environmental assessment process and had to have a, a document created called a record of site condition to allow it to switch to residential use. It uh, has to go through this uh, rezoning, which is a very public process and provides an opportunity for members of the public to provide comments, ask questions, of which council will be listening and the applicant will be listening very carefully to to try to uh, make sure that uh, what, what's proposed is uh, in the public best interest. And uh, there will also be a, a very large and detailed uh, document created called a site plan agreement, which will address a number of the items that may be discussed this evening, even though it's not part of the planning process, it is part of the building process and things like height restrictions, um, different uh, buffering of neighboring, uh, such as uh, was discussed with fencing, uh, light mitigation, all of those types of things fall into the site plan, which council has oversight over as well. So, you know, even though the uh, comments that may be questions or comments that may come out of tonight's meeting may not directly apply to the zoning part of the process, they will be considered seriously and uh, uh, Taken into account as we get through the site plan process, uh, the site plan process, and then of course sewage allocation is a part of it before any building can occur on the site. So just be aware this is a, a perfect opportunity to voice concerns, ask questions, and the council and the applicant will be uh, taking those questions away. We do have a draft bylaw just as a a guideline on what a bylaw would look like on tonight's agenda, but we would not be dealing with that, uh, passing that bylaw tonight. There will give time for uh, staff and, and the applicant to work through some of the issues that may come out of tonight's public meeting to refine the proposal and get it to uh, uh, an, hopefully to an acceptable state. So with that said, uh, the next section of the formal part of the meeting is the is correspondence for council's review. And there has been a number of uh, letters sent to uh, uh, Darlene C. Wilkin, Jean Pepper, Penny and Helmut Rankin, Cleta and Charlie Davis, Terry and Terry Martin, Brent Rose, Michelle Andrews, and I hope I spell, uh, pronounce this right, Gianna At Achatola, Cindy Gilbert and Tim Brooks, and Sue Doherty and Christine Dittner and Doug Fisher. Is there any further correspondence from received in respect to this application? Yes, we received uh, by email on August 18th after the agenda was published and I'm sorry of the pronunciation from Chris McGalkey. Uh, and I did circulate, circulate that to council uh, before this meeting. Uh, and he, his opinion on this project is mixed or neutral. And then he goes on to provide reasoning rationale. I would just, before we get to the, the part where people speak, I have moved people who have requested to speak into the meeting, except Terry Martin, I've been trying to promote you into the meeting. I probably tried seven or eight times now, and it won't, it won't seem to let you into the meeting. I would suggest um, that perhaps you call uh, and, and you can get into the meeting. And the number, okay, of 10 is, um, for toll free 855-703-8985. And I, I'm not sure what the technical problem is. It just won't seem to let 
me move you into the meetings. That's all. Okay. Okay, thank you, Karen. Uh, anyone wishing uh, to get notice of the decision of the bylaw, the bylaw would consider it a regular council meeting uh, following this public meeting, not tonight, but at a future meeting. Persons wishing notice of the passing of the bylaw must submit a written request. And with that, I'll open the floor for any questions or comments from the public. And the first I have on my list is Michelle Andrews and Gianna Achatola. I hope I pronounced that right. Do you have them available, Karen? Yes, they're on the meeting. They're, they're here. They just don't have their camera on. Okay. Michelle or Gianna? Uh, there they are. Hi there. It's, uh, I just want to correct everyone. It's Johnny, G-I-A-N-N-I. -N -N okay. pronounced Johnny. Sorry about that. That's okay. It happens all the time. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, a not, uh, it's, it's an uncommon name. Uh, so I want to, uh, Michelle and I, uh, we live at 307 Jeremy's Crescent. We want to uh, just um, uh, thank, uh, th thank everyone for this opportunity to speak. I also want to thank the council for coming out. Uh, they met with the, uh, the neighborhood to review the site and, and listen to our concerns. So I thank you for that as well. Um, so at this point, uh, uh, Michelle and I, and I think, uh, you know, based on lots of talk with the community I'll, I'll, and the neighborhood, I'll, I'll let them speak for themselves. But um, I think uh, we're all kind of uh, unanimous in the sense that we're concerned about the proposed building. It's a two-story 32 unit in our, in our, uh, in our backyards or surrounding our, our properties. Um, I don't think we're uh, opposed to development in general. Like I think it's we support that, and, and we know and understand the community is growing. Uh, it's this type of build, and and with that, um, the uh, the R three zoning change will allow that to proceed. I know that there's other steps, but it's one step closer to allowing that type of development to proceed. And and I just uh, uh, I think uh, I mean we whatever decision is made is going to affect the neighborhood for like basically permanently for decades to come. So I think that this is extremely important for us to acknowledge uh, how we feel uh, uh, personal homeowners uh, it, with this building going in our backyard and also just with the community in general. Um, I, you know, I thank the, uh, the uh, developer uh, for reviewing those new uh, uh, frames and, presenting those changes that I wasn't aware of. We still have old information in the sense of that. Um, and they did now acknowledge that, you know, it, there's a huge concern with privacy in general, especially on the south and east sides of that building where originally we expected it to, uh, we were presented with a 10 foot allocation on the side, which is really concerning. Uh, the fact that it's 20 is better, but because it, it allows for potential, you know, trees and have you so. But the, you know, the fact that they're able to tower still over our, you know, like the second story is basically towering over the fence line. You can't build a fence high enough for, uh, to, to protect, uh, uh, you know, your privacy. And, and that just proposes another eyesore uh, situation. Um, so, um, you know, I think uh, the nature and, and fabric are, of our neighborhood is all built with single family homes. That's been addressed here in the sense of detached, semi-detached. Uh, row housing with, I, I think the max that I've seen is like three in a row before there's a break between, uh, you know, buildings and uh, they, they all have, uh, you know, they're not towering over adjacent lots. They, uh, they um, have, you know, a fairly decent allocation of land between the established homes that are already there so that it maintains some sort of privacy. Uh, we've been here at, uh, we're, you know, we're the second house in from Jeremy's Crescent. So we're on the Southeast and Basically, the building would start somewhere in the back of us, but we would get affected by those balconies and second story windows. We quite enjoy our backyard. We do everything from having a, like a, a seasonal pool in there to gardening, you know, everything else, family time. And we, we're, we're afraid this is going to cause a fishbowl effect. Uh, everyone's going to be able to, and we're not going to enjoy our property. Uh, we also understand, you know, the maximizing of, of potential, you know, uh, you know, profit, we get that business is business. Everyone wants to try to maximize, uh, you know, uh, their potential for whatever lot, uh, putting as many on as you can. But there's a cost to associated houses that have potentially been there. 
it, it doesn't fit in with the fabric of our community. Like I suggested, they're saying that it potentially would look, I'm going to use the words that they've used, attractive and enhance the neighborhood. I, 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 uh, I, I, I don't agree with that concept. And then on top of the privacy, which was a huge concern, uh, there's a community safety in general. Princess Street is your typical suburban site. It's not a huge main thoroughfare. It handles quite a bit of traffic on its own because of the area residents, but it also is a link between Cork and Dublin, which are super busy uh, streets, uh, all, each leading to community uh, center, hospital, long-term care. There's, uh, you know, uh, resident, uh, what do you call it, uh, the Strathcona community there. There's group homes. And, and on top of all that, we, we have the Mennonites that use that when they pop off of the main to try to get off the main. They use Princess as a side street to get to the clinic, uh, to the community center, so forth, depending on the direction they're coming in. So, and then all that, and I just got to reiterate that we have no sidewalks in the area. There's people on the street walking their dogs, cycling, jogging. Uh, so this is all like we're all trying like I walk my dog twice a day and I'm navigating traffic as I'm forced to basically walk on the street. So we're adding even just uh, it's simple math. If you do the simple math and you have a building of 32 units or 48 parking spots, even if we just call it 48 uh, and they're each doing one trip in and out a day, it's adding at least 100 trips a day. Uh, and that adds, uh, and if there's any double trips or anything, people working, and then when they come home, go to the store just to get, lo uh, you know, go to local services or whatever, you're basically adding a minimum of a thousand extra uh, uh, traffic uh, transactions onto Princess Street, onto this existing busy place that's not really built for that, and uh, with community members that really can't navigate properly. Uh, because they're forced to walk on the street. So um, I just, you know, there, the, again, uh, there's, it, it doesn't meet the fabric. There's a safety concern, definite privacy concern. And then we understand the profit piece, but it, it could be at a cost of our, our, our land may depreciate as well, because it might not be attractive for us to, uh, you know, just, you know, to live in the area. And that could pose a problem uh, for even for future resale. So um, I've written a pretty extensive letter with Michelle uh, addressing all our concerns. There's other ones. There's like snow removal and people, uh, you know, uh, potentially having to park on side streets to, to manage that cleaning of, the, of that significant space, light pollution. Uh, but anyways, I, I think I've said my piece. I know that others are going to probably... Uh, elaborate on other uh, the same or other topics that I haven't covered and again thank you for your opportunity uh, for the opportunity great thank you sorry sorry uh, uh, Gianni could you just state your address for the record please yeah we sorry we are 307 Jeremy's Crescent okay. so we're just, at the basically the corner of Princess and Jeremy yeah thank just you. a reminder anyone else that's speaking from the public if you can just uh, identify yourself and your address thank you okay great thank you karen and thank you johnny uh, next we have on our list uh, terry martin has terry been able to connect karen yes he's uh he's on a phone he's on a phone and terry can you hear us and can you speak can we hear I, you? hello i can hear you can you hear me yes we can that's great <laughs> And I, I wanted to join. Uh, thank you. Um, I wanted to join with the computer, but the internet connection here is is, is poor. So at least I am on the phone. So uh, thank you to the councillors and the mayor for um, for this meeting, our chance to speak to this project. Um, I'd like to express my concern over the impact of this zoning change from R two to R three, and I know that that property supports a higher density. Um, we have no issue with this increased density to provide more rental units. However, I don't believe that a two-story 32-unit apartment building is suitable for this space. This land is surrounded on all sides by single-family homes in a well-established neighborhood. Now I see that they have uh, taken into consideration that setback, so rather than the 10 feet, it's now 20 feet. And like Gian said, it will allow for some landscaping um, to 
mitigate the sight line. However, um, for one thing, we haven't been able to see this site plan. It wasn't the new site plan. It wasn't circulated to us. And so we haven't had time to look at it to respond to it. So that's unfortunate. I like the idea that the laneway is centered now so that the um, properties on either side are less affected by the entranceway because there's so much traffic that would be coming in and out of there that I think the sight lines and the safety and the privacy of the adjacent neighbors needs to be taken into consideration. And we already have a lot of traffic, as Johnny said, we have a lot of traffic on Princess Street and this development will, it will cause a lot more traffic and it's the major routes between the hospital, the medical clinic, the nursing home and the recreational center. Um, and there's also, I believe 130 home subdivision going in right here, whose main access to downtown Mount Forest is going to be up Cork Street and their um, access to the hospital and the medical clinic is going to be up Princess Street. So we're going to have a lot of traffic coming up and down that street. So am I still here on your mic? Yeah. Yes, we can still hear you. Okay. Um, let's see. So anyway, my name is Terry Martin and I live at uh, 781 Princess Street. However, I also have uh, four rental units in two semi-detached homes on Jeremy Street at 311 and 315 Jeremy Street. And I'm also on their long border on the other side with my rental buildings who have triplexes there and, and a lot that we would like to develop. And this of course will impact what we are able to do with our property with the vacant area. Um, I was concerned about the grade on the property. It's above our property line and wondering if there's effective drainage plan or flood water protection in place. And does the site plan meet fire code restrictions? Where's the nearest fire hydrant? Is there sufficient access for the firefighters? Um, I had mentioned that we had a meeting with uh, Ken Matthews and talked about uh, a site plan that we had when we were um, considering buying this property and it was for 15 townhomes, townhouse style buildings. They were barrier free. Each unit faced each other across a central laneway. Each unit would have 975 square feet with a private driveway to an attached garage, a rear patio, private green space, and a front landscape yard. And it would be more appropriate to the target market that Ken stated he wanted to attract. And these this style of town home would fit nicely in the style with the style of homes in the community. And we already have an example of this at Al Sharp's property on uh, Sligo Road. Um, just I noticed at the when I was looking over the agenda for the meeting that uh, there were some bullet points that ArchCon put forward for the benefits of their proposal, and I and I would like to address each one of those bullet points as being um, things that I disagree with. So the first one, the housing types in this area already enjoy a wide range and supply of housing types, single detached, semi-detached, triplex and fourplex buildings. And many of the uh, homes in this community are barrier free, which better support those with accessibility requirements. And this building will not visually enhance the neighborhood. It will tower over the nearest neighbors and destroy our privacy and our property values. And on my rental units, I could imagine uh, my renters might uh, be affected by this and, and want to move out. And then I would have to try and rent again. And it might not uh, be attractive to very many people to have this thing towering over their backyard. Another bullet point, the best and highest use of this vacant land would be one story cluster townhomes that would be compatible with the neighborhood. We're not against density. However, this proposed site plan negatively affects many established homes adjacent to the property. We would ask council to decline the zoning change for this proposal 
and ask the developer to come up with a plan that fits into this community. Buildings should be of similar size and scope as existing neighborhood buildings. It should not negatively impact close neighbors. It should be in sync with the neighborhood and the people who live there. Thank you for considering our neighborhood. That's, Thanks, Sarah. Um, okay. No, did you have something further? I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I, I was done. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Terry. And next on our list is Penny Rankin. Penny, are you with us? Yes, she is. Okay. Penny, you're whenever on, you're ready. You're on go mute, ahead. Penny. There you go. Okay. Uh, well, good evening, Mayor and Councillors, and thank you for the opportunity to speak on this matter. I would like to thank everyone, the Councillors and Mayor, for coming to the meeting to join us and discuss our issues. And out of that, um, I'd like to thank Archdon for um, relating to some of the concerns and addressing them. And I may be reiterating comments already said. Uh, one thing, it was mentioned that there was a three-story commercial building be in that lot previously. When we bought our property, that commercial building was there. Our property sat on the market for a long time and the sign came down. It was still for sale, but they had given up hope of, of selling it. And I believe it was because of that large building behind us. Um, we bought the building, this house for other reasons other than that, but I, it, it did deter buyers from buying. Mention it's a period. Oh, yeah, I just did. Okay. And I'd like to say that the picture of the proposed plan looks very nice. However, we feel that this apartment complex belongs on a much larger piece of real estate in an area more suited for that size of building. And we have the matter of privacy. The residents on the back side of the building will lose privacy that we now have. And yes, the privacy fence you're referring to will be fine for people on the first story of the building, will not affect the ones on the second story of the building that can still look down into our yards on Jeremy's Crescent. Oh, and sorry, my name is Penny Rankin and we live at 319 Jeremy's Crescent. Um, so we will no longer be able to enjoy relaxing in our yards in private. And depending on how close everything is, if we have to block off some of our back rooms, then we're not enjoying it. And we will not be able to get the sunshine to enjoy either in our windows or in the backyard for, due to the height of the building. And has any thought been given to the amount of increased traffic on Princess Street that this will create? With no sidewalks, the children wait for school buses at curbside and this could be an accident waiting to happen. And were any studies done on the traffic situation before this process began? And if not, why not? We now have a newly renovated hospital with more housing being built in Mount Forest and nearby areas. There will be more people attending the hospital and medical center, creating more traffic. Vehicles intending to visit the hospital, the medical center or the long-term care facility coming from the west end of town or the southwest portions in town will use Cork Street and Princess Street to attend them. Already this would be more traffic than is current and that hasn't included the traffic that this building will create. To be considered are the ambulances which regularly use this travel path when accessing or leaving the hospital from the west end of town and how are they to navigate the increased traffic. On the west end of Princess Street, as you know, are the sports complex, ball pavilion, pavilion area, playground, skateboard area, and a proposed swimming pool, which are only a block away. Children are constantly walking, biking, or with a scooter or skateboard on the way to the park. The increased traffic will definitely be a hazard to them. In addition, our area has a high Mennonite population with their buggies. They use Princess Street to access the hospital in one direction and the sports complex for blood donations in the other direction. Traffic must adhere to them to provide them the right of way. And we have a lot of seniors in the area who walk for their exercise. Also a lot of people, some seniors, some not, 
who walk their dogs on the road. In this area, there are two group homes. Very often you will see a caregiver pushing one of their residents in a wheelchair in order to get them outside for air and to see different scenery. Where are they supposed to travel with the increased traffic? All of the above reasons will create a traffic hazard for the citizen currently living in this area. And what statistics do you have for traffic? With a proposed apartment, supposedly for seniors, 55 and older, this increased traffic would be an all day problem, not just early morning and late afternoon. And do the plans for the building include any possibility for fire hazards? How are the fire trucks to enter the, the one laneway which is accessing the building? And where will they be situated with all the parked cars? And you have to take into account that very often there will be multiple fire trucks, ambulances and police attending as well, depending on the situation. They are considered a three tier response. It is my understanding that the fire vehicles will need access to leave the premises without having to do a three point turn. There looks to be barely enough room for them to enter with parked cars on both sides of the lot. And I have put in a request to the fire department for confirmation on any ruling in this area for that. And I know apparently it is a ruling in another area. And there's also no mention in the report of plans for garbage disposal. Where would the bins be located until the garbage pickup date? Yellow bags are now only picked up every second week. Will they be contained inside the apartment building or outside where they will smell? And the report mentions the height of a proposed building 9.4 meters. It also mentions being compatible with the existing community on page seven. 9.4 meters is not compatible with any building surrounding this property. If you stand in the middle of the property and do a 360 degree turn, you will not see any two story building. It will detract from the look of the neighborhood, not enhance it, nor will it be complementary to the existing residential uses, your words also on page seven. You admit on page five that the surrounding area is characterized by a range of low rise residential development. So how does your two story building fit in with that? Your report also indicated that there is an apartment complex north of Waterloo Street. The only one that I know of is on Queen Street and is again one story, not at all like your proposed building. Under 3.1, it mentions that the County of Wellington official plan directs that residential development occurring within urban centers should be planned and developed in a manner that ensures the character and integrity of existing residential areas is preserved and that development is compatible with established neighborhoods and is committed to maintaining the small town character of urban centers. I'm sorry, but nowhere in that statement can I see the vision of a two story apartment building. Though new buildings in an intensified state are being built, we are still managing to have the feel of a small town. That is why we chose to live here. I spoke with a gentleman at the farmer's market last Saturday, and he advised me that he has just re relocated to Mount Forest. Why? because he liked the look of the town and the feel of the small town atmosphere. And also there is one of the local residents involved in this that had the same reason for moving here. I'm afraid that I beg to differ on page 11, you advise that your apartment building will be a positive addition to the neighborhood and will be an improvement for the existing vacant land. Sorry, but I'll choose the condition of the vacant land. I disagree when on page 11, you advise that the setbacks are generous. They certainly are not when the neighbors are considered and you think two stories are low rise. In 6.1.3, it states that policy 1.5.1 of the PPS states that the community should be promoted by planning public street, et cetera, to be safe, meeting the needs of pedestrians. With no traffic study, I don't think your plans meet this criteria, nor have you taken any existing residents into consideration. Again, in section 6.3.1, the growth strategy is to protect the county's unique small town character and land uses. There are other means of achieving the intensification required by the growth plan, the Wellington County Official Plan and the Wellington North Community Growth Plan. 
we and our neighbors have expected a building to be constructed on the site and have no opposition to that. However, we did not expect to have one that is so unsuitable to our neighborhood. There will be some increase in the traffic on Princess Street, but only half the amount that would occur in a 32 unit building. That's if you were to go with say a 15 unit single story. As your report indicated, there are already semis and townhouses on the neighboring streets and within a couple of block radius. There is also a proposal for a 58 detached homes, 30 semi-detached homes, and 36 multifamily or townhouses just around the corner on Cork Street. Surely that should satisfy the request and these plans for more density in the area. We know that you and the council have been supplied with an alternate plan for units. There may not be as many units as you have planned, but at least they will comply with the look of the neighborhood and will satisfy that more density is being introduced into the built boundary of Mount Forest. These alternate plans will fit in with ambience of the neighborhood and will not affect any privacy issues, either with the use of our backyard or with being able to peek into bedroom windows. The residents will have their own garage, which is much preferable to a senior rather than having to go out and scrape snow and ice of their car every time leaving the property or having to walk across the parking lot to attain the storage lockers. And they won't have to carry groceries, etc., from their cars to the building. All through your report, you speak of maintaining the stability and character of the existing neighborhood by supporting its character. You are obviously speaking about orange and apples when speaking to the surrounding residents. By all means, prioritize appropriate intensification within the urban areas, but make sure that the buildings comply with existing buildings. Your plans would look great on a much larger property, and I'm sure there are still plenty of properties within the area which would conform to having a building such as yours. You can fulfill the intensification just as well in another location within surrounding buildings that are far more suited to your plans. In your summary 7.0, you advise that the proposed site and building design will resi result in an attractive, high quality development which visually enhances the neighborhood. That might be true in another location, but it certainly will not enhance our neighborhood for the reasons which have been aforementioned. If you proceed with your plan, our residents will lose financial value. We will lose an integrity and pride in our homes, and we feel that the integrity of the community will be put in jeopardy. Our homes will no longer provide the pride and enjoyment which they should. We know that growth will occur, but that council should balance the needs for the growth in the area and also take into consideration the needs of the existing residents that pay the taxes. We are requesting that you reconsider and build a one-story apartment complex it is far more suitable to our neighborhood. The current land doesn't do justice to your building and the building doesn't do justice to our neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks, <coughs> excuse me, thanks Penny. Uh, next uh, we registered, we have uh, Cindy Gilbert. Cindy, are you with us? Yes, I'm here. Welcome Cindy. Hello. Um, I'm just going to read the letter that I submitted. Now, some of the things have been um, said already and it's been very repetitive, but I just want to say that I feel the reason it has been repetitive is because these are very important issues and we all recognize that. And I just hope that um, everyone listening, listening can um, take that into consideration. Um, my name is Cindy Gilbert and along with Tim Brooks and my 10 year old daughter, Julia, and our two dogs named Stella, we live at 771 Princess Street. We would like to start off by saying that we have always known that something is gonna be built behind us and even beside us. This is not what we're concerned about. However, this land does not support the current proposed site plan. Specifically, we have two major concerns associated with the proposed site plan and a list of questions we would like answers to. Um, firstly, there is a safety threat to our many seniors, children, and families that walk on Princess Street. There are no sidewalks, so people are forced to walk on the road. Uh, children walking to school, seniors walking for daily activity, and people walking their dogs are all on the road. 
The proposed entranceway does not take into account the sight lines needed to safely ensure that these individuals on the road can be seen by drivers exiting and entering an apartment building. Princess Street is not wide enough to accommodate parked cars, walkers, and a huge traffic increase. It's a recipe for disaster and someone will get hurt. The proposed site plan does not show a driveway wide enough to accommodate two-way traffic. Um, that may be um, changed now, but um, in the site plan that we saw, there was not two-way traffic. Um, and if that's the case, I wanna know where a car will go if they meet another car uh, when entering and exiting the building. Um, secondly, our privacy is important to us, and I'm sure everyone would agree with that. My daughter will be able to jump on her trampoline in our backyard and high five a person on their balcony on the other side of the fence. This is not okay. Again, we are not opposed to a building in our backyard. It's the closeness to our lot and the two story height that is an issue. The part of the proposed building that runs along the back fence of our property would be considered the front yard as it faces Princess Street. Is that correct? An entranceway cannot be a front yard, um, leaving the property line immediately behind us. The current proposed site plan does not allow for this. Um, and in 13.2.3, under R3 regulations, it says that a front yard must have 19.7 feet. Um, and the, the builders at the beginning there had addressed the uh, side yard at the back of the building, which um, I guess is considered the side yard, we are the property that I would consider being the front yard and she didn't address what that setback is going to be. If, if that's still 10 feet, then I have a major issue with that. Um, a couple questions we have is where is visitor parking going to be? Um, because we all have visitors and they're gonna end up probably parking on the road. Um, and Right now, this, the, um, the uh, width of the road does not accommodate two parked cars on either side of the road and, and traffic going up and down. So I'd like to know where visitor parking will be. Um, somebody already mentioned this, garbage disposal, where is that going to be? Um, where is the excess snow going to be moved to? Um, and I also wanted to know, and maybe you had said about this already, but our, another question was if it's rezoned to R3, does that automatically mean that the proposed site, which has already been changed, which is important to note, I think they're making changes because they realize it doesn't suit uh, this land, um, the proposed building. Um, so in closing, the best case scenario, we ask council to please consider a one story design, a townhouse, a row house, semi-detached building, so that we and our adjoining affected neighbors can enjoy some privacy while allowing the owners some land appropriate building to take place. More importantly, please create a new appropriate and safe entranceway into, the, into whatever is built. Worst case scenario, if council intends to pass the rezoning of this property with the current site plan against everyone's better judgment, please consider flipping the plan. If the parking lot ran along where all the residential lots and the apartment building ran along the west side of the property along Cork Street where there is no current backyards, this would alleviate some of our privacy issues but still not solve the entranceway nightmare. That problem will leave up to you as council. Oh, and the other thing that they had said at the beginning, the building that was here was not close close to our property line at all. So I'd like to um, say that uh, it wasn't closer to our property at all. Um, so that statement was not true. Okay, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Cindy. Um, next on our uh, uh, list here is uh, Sue Doherty. Hi, Maybe thank I... you for, sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead Sue, welcome. Thank you. Uh, I just had a few questions. Of course, I agree with all of the comments that 
have been made, so I don't really want to go over them again. There's obviously a lot of concern within the neighborhood. Um, I am not directly affected by the apartment complex, but um, I do feel that it will be detrimental to the neighborhood. I live at 335 Jeremy's Crescent. Uh, and uh, I have actually only been in this community since uh, February of 2020. And one of the reasons I did move here was for the uh, small town atmosphere, which I was hoping would be uh, would be kept. And I understand that we do need to grow, but we also need to grow appropriately. And we do need to take into consideration the existing uh, properties as well as the existing landowners. Um, in the drawings that we did receive, um, there was no, not that I could see anyway, there was no lighting in the drawings and I'm assuming that there will be parking lot lighting. Is that correct? Can somebody answer that question? Um, Andrea, are you with us still? I'm, I'm still here and yes, I'm happy to speak to that. Um, so as it's been mentioned, there will be a site plan approval process that we'll also have to go through. And that's where detailed design such as um, drainage plans, lighting, landscaping, all of those uh, fire, fire access, all of that gets dealt with that site plan. Uh, so there will be a requirement for lighting on the site, although um, in saying that it's almost always a uh, municipal requirement that there's no spillover onto surrounding properties. So they have to use fixtures that are full cut off and to make sure that that light doesn't spread to um, surrounding properties. But that will be something that will be uh, certainly reviewed in detail by municipal staff through the site plan process. Right, so the public does not have any say into the site plan process though, correct? It so is. The, the, I'll, I'll tackle that one. The site plan process is still a public process. It's not like the zoning bylaw amendment where there's a public meeting, however, it is a public process. Council endorses the site plan, and uh, it, so it's fully public through the council meeting process. But there isn't a public meeting. We do take site plan comments and questions during the planning public meeting and move them into the site plan process. So they are considered in the site plan process. Okay. Um, can anybody tell me if any of these units will uh, provide affordable housing? So I'm just not sure what you, what's your definition of affordable housing? I think, I think well, the applicant those... is, Sorry, is looking ahead. at, at this providing lower cost housing than say the single family detached or semis or those types of things because the, uh, the footprint is smaller, but I'm just wondering what it is you mean by affordable housing. Well, basically, we do realize that we have an issue even with rental units that there's lots of people that can't afford the market. Um, price for rental units right now. So by affordable housing, for those people that are um, not necessarily able to work full time or on disability, situations like that, will it provide any below market rental housing? Okay. I, I don't know the answer. I, I doubt it, but I'll let Andrea address that if you would, Andrea, please. Yes, thank you. Um, so what we're trying to achieve here is attainable affordable housing or attainable rental housing, sorry. Um, so it's not um, subsidized housing. It's not, uh, it likely will not meet provincial definition of affordable housing. However, um, the building's been designed in a way to keep, uh, what we're trying to do is keep the rents on the lower side. Um, we're not, this isn't meant to be a luxury rental. Um, they really want this to be attainable to a large number of people who cannot find rental housing in the Mount Forest area. Um, but there are a number of things that factor into the cost. So for example, uh, single story townhouse units as a rental product uh, are going to be more expensive to rent than sort of the smaller units within an apartment. Uh, I don't know the exact rents at this stage, but it is um, an important objective of our client to provide something that is attainable to a number of people who are looking for rental housing in this area. Um, are there any plans to put sidewalks on <clears throat> Princess Street due to uh, this possible zoning amendment as well as all of the other building that's going on? 
So from a township perspective, there currently isn't plans for uh, sidewalks on Princess Street, but we have been having significant discussions about places around town where sidewalks are needed. And I would agree with many of the comments made uh, by members of the public that this is a place where sidewalks probably are required and will be needed in the future. And so I think that uh, will be part of the considerations when we get to the site plan process as well. Okay, and I, I guess I just want to say one other thing is I'm always concerned when there are zoning amendments because that sets a precedent for other properties to be rezoned as well. And, and uh, that's always a concern. Um, in my letter, I did state that there was obviously a reason, a reason why it was zoned as R2 in the first place. And I don't really necessarily know why that should change. So I can provide a little bit, little bit of historical context for that in that uh, the property actually was zoned commercial. As you may be aware, it was a tire uh, facility, uh, which was operated as a commercial facility. And when in a situation like this, when in the official plan, it's not in a commercially uh, designated area, when the commercial activity ceases, then it reverts to the zoning of the surrounding area, in this case, R2. Right, okay. Um, is Mount Forest meeting our intensifi intensification targets right now? So in terms of intensification, uh, we don't have specific intensification targets in, in, uh, for Mount Forest specifically, but we have countywide intensification targets and we have been meeting them largely from the countywide perspective. Okay, thank you. Did you have anything further, Sue? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay, thank you very much for, thank you very much for all of you for taking the time to come and uh, speak with us this evening. Do you have anybody else registered to speak, Karen? Uh, no, I do not. I would just like to ask though, I see that Sherry is uh, still on video, but also on phone. Can I just confirm, Sherry, that you are 519-321-1533? Yes. Okay. I'll make sure that you're allowed to speak. Okay. No, I don't have anybody else registered. Okay. So we'll move on to the next section of our agenda, which is comments, questions from council, and I'll open the floor for members of council to ask questions or make comments. Anybody like to dive in first? We'll go ahead, Dan. I'll start. I, I really just want to want to say thank you to to all the people that that uh, wrote wrote letters, uh, commented here tonight. Uh, thank you, you know, for your passionate comments, emails, phone calls, visits, and you know some of the some of the comments, a lot of the comments that have been made here tonight uh, will be taken into consideration. The developer has, has made some adjustments. Let's uh, let's hope that some of these comments that have been made here tonight will will make him uh, make some other other adjustments to make this uh, uh, a compatible uh, use to that, to that property and a compatible um, development, I guess, for the surrounding, uh, for the surrounding homes. So anyway, we'll, uh, we'll certainly take all these comments uh, into consideration and go from there. Okay, thanks, Dan. Anybody else? Steve, go ahead. For you, uh, Mayor Lennox, I think this is uh, part and parcel to the, our, our process uh, of a public meeting and seeing what is uh, the concerns of the neighbors surrounding this property. I know, um, I know we all went and, uh, and listened to their uh, 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 concerns and issues on site, and I think this is a great uh, way to bring it public and hopefully ArchCon takes into consideration these concerns and uh, everyone on the council does as well. And we uh, move forward and uh, hopefully there's uh, compromises to be made and uh, find a, 
find a, a good solution for everyone. As they say, good fences make good neighbors. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Anyone else? Uh, Lisa, go ahead. Um, yes, and I don't know who to ask this of, and it's maybe a long question, and it's something I've likely missed. Um, what is um, the, the height of the proposed building? Um, I know it's a two-story building, and a, a two-story house would likely be 20 to 25 feet, and um, what's currently allowed, um, I'd just like to know if someone could correct me if I'm wrong, um, on the R2 zoning, we could currently have detached house, we could have four plexes that could be up to 34 and a half feet and a little bit less than 20 feet back from the side yard or 24 point something from the rear yard. If you want to flip that property around and call it a rear yard, like um, people are alluding to that it should be, right? Um, so how does this property kind of height wise and setback wise differ from what is currently allowed in our R2 zone? Complicated question, I think. <laughs> okay. Um, Jessica, can you address some of the, the R2 specifications and how it relates to this? And then maybe Andrea can address the height of the proposed application. Yes, so just pulling up the bylaw here. Um, so I think Andrea addressed it in a um, bit of her presentation. Um, I, the proposed, or sorry, the, um, okay, yeah, so I was just double checking. Um, so the maximum building height in the R3 zone is 12 meters or 39.5 feet. Um, and then because of the shape of the lot, it does become a couple interior side yard setbacks versus rear yard and front yard. So there really is only going to be one front yard, which is the property line that runs along Princess Street. Everything else is considered an interior side yard. And then there is the rear yard. Um, which is at the very back of the property that would run parallel to the front yard. Um, so that kind of comes into consideration when you're looking at all the different setbacks. Um, so the R3 zone does have a maximum building height of 12 meters and then the interior side yard minimum uh, is half the building height, but in no case less than three meters. So because I I think Andrea might be able to confirm, but the building height, um, half of it was 4.5 meters, I think was the interior side yard setback. I see Darren jumping in here too, so he might be able to confirm some of those setbacks. Um, but uh, the building height was, I think, below the 12 meters. I think it was around 10.5 meters that they're proposing. Does that help with some of your questions? Mm -hmm. I think the question too was what would R2 allow as well, but I see Mike with his hand up, so maybe I'll let him jump in here briefly. Yeah, I, I was just going to address the, the difference, the R2 and the R3. So yeah, the R2 height restriction is 10 and a half meters, and Darren will jump in if I'm way offline in terms of what I'm telling you, but I think that was the original question from Councillor Hearn. What, what is being proposed by the proponent, I believe, and Andrea, I'll look to you, is 9.5 meters which would actually meet the R2 zoning. Um, the, the reason for the R3 request is for the apartment. So in theory, and again, this is just theory, it's not the, the proponent could go ahead and build two-story townhouses that were the same height as what he's proposing for the apartment and meet the requirements of the R2. Yeah, that's right. Okay. And did you have something further you wanted to add, Darren? No, that, that's correct. Um, just wanted to confirm that, yes, the height that's being proposed, I believe it's actually 9.4 meters, um, which falls under the 10.5 that are currently permitted under the R2 zone. So um, to Mike's point, uh, exactly that, that four plexes or townhouses could be built on the property 
at a height that actually exceeds what's being proposed here uh, with the zoning that's permitted as of right. So um, no other amendments are being sought on the R3 other than we needed the R3 to permit the use. Um, but as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, um, we know that there's always a concern when you say you have a proposal that's a certain height um, that through site plan somehow it could be increased. So um, why what I mentioned is through the zoning, we'd be uh, agreeable to adding a maximum height of 10 and a half meters, which is consistent with the maximum height that exists today. There's no intention to build up to the 12 meters that the R3 zone would normally permit. And similar to that, um, we were agreeable to putting in a maximum unit count so that there's no additional units being added once we get um, to the site plan process. And in terms of, sorry, in terms of that side yard, um, yes, I believe the bylaw would require 4.7 meters and we're uh, exceeding six meters on the current proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Lisa, did, does that answer your questions? Um, yes, I, I think so. So basically, um, height wise and rear or side side yard wise, um, what is proposed here, leaving everything else aside, would would conform to our R zone R two zoning that's already in place. Correct. It could be done without an amendment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Steve, go ahead. You're muted, by the way, Steve. Sorry, I think Sherry has her hand up, uh, Mary Lennox, and then I would like okay. to ask a question afterwards. Okay, Sherry, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. Please go ahead if you have questions, comments. I do. Um, I'd just, I'd like, just to like, like to thank everyone, everyone that participated, participated in, the meeting. in the meeting. Sherry, if you and can, Sherry. I also have a question that wasn't um, part of some of the neighborhood questions. That was part of some of the neighborhood and that and is, that is uh, uh, to, um, um, the, developer. the developer. What about green space? With that many units, should there not be some type of green space area uh, for people to um, sit outside or some kind of green space where there's benches and things like that? Wondering if that's a consideration. Okay. I'm not sure who to direct that one to. Andrea, would you like to tackle that one? Sure, and apologies. I was um, having unstable internet before, which is why I kept not showing you my face. But uh, there is, so in addition to the individual um, balconies, there is plans for exterior, um, more uh, common green space area that all residents will be able to use. Um, it'll be a fairly large patio area. The details of that have not been worked out. That'll happen through the site plan process. But yes, there have been uh, accommodations made for both private individual um, open space and form of balconies, as well as some ground floor um, amenity area. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Sherry. And if, and if I may, um, I just hope that uh, through this process that the developer will take uh, some of some of the additional comments made uh, by the neighbors into consideration. Okay, thanks, Sherry. Karen, I see you have your hand up. Uh, so Sydney Gilbert is has been moved out of the meeting because she's had the opportunity to speak, but she has her hand up. I'm I I believe she wants to speak again so that would be at um uh, at the direction of council okay uh, i think i better go around with deal with council's uh, questions and comments first and then we'll see whether council is open to that or not go ahead councillor mccabe thank you mayor lennox um i know uh, council received um uh, the original plan that the martins had for their um, proposed site plan for this property. I wonder if ArchCon has given any uh, thought to that where it's 15, I believe it's 15 uh, units, one story with the uh, parking lot down the middle instead of two stories parking lot on the uh, west side of the, uh, of the property. 
Andrea, are you able to address that? Uh, I think all I can say on that uh, regard is our, our clients are certainly aware that that alternative proposal has been prepared. It's not what they're um, pursuing with these applications. And as I spoke to earlier, in large part, um, that goes to sort of their overall goal to have these to be more attainable rental. And um, I don't have the exact numbers to compare, but I do know that that proposal would be uh, for, far more costly in terms of what the and price would be of those if they were to be uh, rental townhouse units. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other, any other questions from council? I have just a couple here myself. I'll maybe dive in with that. Um, and I think Andrea, I'm going to address this one to you. When, when on site, uh, clearly the property is uh, largely because of its previous use is graded up relatively high. Uh, uh, relative to the neighboring properties. And since height is uh, being raised as such a major concern by the neighbors, has any consideration been given to actually reducing the grade of the existing property before the, the uh, building would be constructed or, or have, has grading been uh, reached uh, the consideration stage at this point? I will, uh, I don't want to <laughs> attempt to speak engineer and screw it up, but um, I know our, um, our engineers are listening today. That's certainly something I'll take back to the team. Um, they have been working through grading plans for the site and there may be an opportunity to um, sort of address that grade. So uh, it's certainly something we can be prepared to speak to when this matter comes back or through correspondence um, back to planning staff. So Unfortunately, I just don't have the details of the grading um, in my sort of in front of me right now. Right. I just felt that that was probably an option to, based on my layman's look at the property, that that might be an option to help address some of the neighbor's concerns. Uh, also, so I, uh, I just had my team sort of messaging me on the side, but they did say, um, we'll look at how we can adjust the grading plan to see if that's something that can be uh, done to sort of reduce the the height differential between this property and the surrounding. Okay, thank you. Then my next question, and I know that a number of residents raised this when I met with some of them on site, was not, it was not just about the building setback, but it was about the balcony setback relative to the property line. So I just want some clarification when we're talking setbacks from particularly from, let's say the east property line, um, are we talking setbacks to the main part of the building or are we talking setbacks to the balconies? And if, if it's just to the main part of the building, how big are those balconies, I guess is my question. Sure, so the um, setback is to the building itself. The balconies are slightly closer, although they, the balconies still meet the minimum setback. So they're not encroaching into the side yard setback requirement. Um, I don't have the exact depths of the balconies. They're usually about 1.8 meters, um, but I'm not sure the exact, uh, they're five feet, sorry, in depth. Okay. So from the, the, the approximately 20 foot setback, it would be a, a five feet less to the balcony edge. Just yeah, we're at about 20 feet, four inches. So yeah, it'll be five feet less to the balconies. Okay, okay. And then I guess my only other comment was around the driveway access and sight lines and those types of things. And I'm gonna actually direct this more to our staff. Um, when with, with any application for development, those sight lines have to meet certain requirements in order for it to be an acceptable entrance. Is that not correct? Based on fire, emergency personnel entry and safety of exit onto our streets. Mike, do you wanna tackle that? Yeah, I see, I see Matt jumping on as well, uh, and um, Darren will perhaps have comments too. We, yeah, typically we have sightline triangles uh, that we give consideration to to make sure that yeah that there's clear access in and out of the properties themselves. So it is something that we consider with all applications. And that's based on established engineering standards, is it not? Yeah. So Matt, go ahead, Matt. Sorry. Um, thanks, Mayor. Yeah, there's also turning radiuses that, that would be part of the assessment of what's proposed um, as far as truck, truck turning radiuses, and, and those would be based on engineering standards. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think I have any further questions right now. Certainly, uh, I would like to uh, thank the residents for their yeah, Lennox, and... I think I think Darren had one other comment around the, the site line piece just before you leave that topic. Okay, yeah. go ahead, Darren. Uh, yeah, just with the turning radius, um, it's uh, regulated through, say, the municipal uh, servicing standard and the building code to make sure that fire trucks can safely uh, enter and exit the, the site. So, so absolutely, we'll be looking at that from a few angles uh, through site plan review. Okay, thank you. So uh, I'm just going to wrap up a few of my comments, and I'll open it back up to members of council. Karen, uh, just, go uh, ahead. Yeah, Councillor Burke has her hand raised as well. Okay. Oh, yes, I see it now. <laughs> so I'll just wrap up, Sherry, and then I'll let you have a go at it. I think so. You. I just I just wanted to, uh, again, thank all the residents for taking the time to uh, share their thoughts and, and concerns with us. Uh, certainly, we will give it serious consideration and uh, expect that the applicant will give it serious consideration as we move to the next stage. Um, and uh, I would also like to thank the applicant for uh, being here to help to address these concerns as we went along. Uh, just in terms of the process going forward, of course, we will take all these information, all the information gathered this evening. Uh, the applicant will take it as well. There will be further discussions before this comes back to council for a vote on the rezoning. So just uh, in terms of the process. Okay, Sherry, uh, I think I'm done, so go ahead. Okay, so I think Councillor McCabe asked this question and I'm just, I'm just looking for clarification because I am having some connectivity issues here. As you can see, you can probably see me, but I'm also on my phone. Um, I'm, and this question I'm, goes to Andrea actually so that she can address it uh, from her client's standpoint. Is this proposal of the 32 unit development um, the only configuration uh, that could be proposed. I think Steve asked about the Martins um, development that we all received, and I'm just wondering, is it 32 units um, or and nothing, or are is there consideration or room to reconfigure the proposal? Andrea? Sure. So um, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so the proposal that's before everyone tonight is the proposal that our client is proceeding with. Um, that being said, we're listening to all the comments uh, tonight. We'll be looking and considering uh, everything. Um, however, they're, you know, they're, they're not um, pursuing a townhouse concept. They would like to build for apartment. Um, we heard the comment earlier about potentially flipping so that the buildings on the other side flipped with the parking. Um, that may work. However, you'll sort of have the same situation now with the properties that face onto Cork Street with the building close to their backyard. So it's, um, you know, it might be something that physically works. I'm not sure if it's going to really resolve the issue or just create a new issue for those residents. Um, but we are uh, considering all the comments received today and we'll look at um, if there's further adjustments that can be made um, to help alleviate some of the concerns. I know in uh, certainly by shifting the building from the earlier version, um, it would have been more challenging to put landscaping. We now have room to do um, some very extensive landscaping along that um, shared property line with the properties on Jeremy. So that will definitely be something that we'll be looking at. And um, while it's more part of the site plan process, I think there would be a willingness on our part to share um, those landscape plans when this comes back before council again. But uh, we'll certainly be considering everything we've heard this evening. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from council at this point? Okay, Karen, you said you had Cindy Gilbert on that wanted to ask a question still, is that? Her hand is up, uh, yeah, her virtual hand is up. I can so move her into the meeting. Yeah, certainly uh, with Council's permission, I would uh, invite her to make a final comment. Uh, uh, we certainly want to get as much information on the table as we can to address this. So unless anyone objects, uh, I would invite Cindy back to uh, take her comments. 
Hi, thank you so much. I just wanted to ask one quick question about, you talked about side yard and rear yard and interior yard, but I just want to know what you're considering, just our back fence. What is that going to be considered and what is the setback? Because it wasn't mentioned um, earlier. So Andrea, if you could, uh, we're on the, like the south side, like kind of towards uh, the entrance on Princess Street there, our back fence. Um, I don't know what it's considered, and I want to know what the setback is going to be. Thank you. So just to be clear, Cindy, your property fronts on Princess Street and would be directly east of the driveway. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Uh, Andrea, are you able to tackle that one? Yes. Thank you for clarifying that. I was just trying to pull up my Google Maps to make sure I'm speaking to the right. So um, the... Front yard setback is measured as the setback from Princess Street. So it would be if there was a dwelling kind of in the location of the driveway, that would be where the front yard is measured to, which this obviously exceeds all the other. And then the far opposite, um, which I guess is the northernmost property line, that's considered the rear yard. And then everything else is considered a side yard. So um, the requirement from what would be your backyard, essentially, um, to the development. The requirement is 4.7 meters, I believe. Um, and the current proposal uh, exceeds that. It's, it's just under 20 feet. So about 19 feet, eight inches, which I believe has also been um, increased from earlier versions of the plan. But that your, where your um, rear yard meets the project, that's actually considered a side yard by the definitions of the bylaw. Thank you. Did that answer your question, Cindy, or did we hit the mark with that one? Yes, thank you so much for giving me another opportunity to ask that question. Okay, thank you. Do we, we don't have any further questions, Karen, at this point. Uh, one, once more around for council, any questions or comments before we uh, move on to the next step? I'm good, Mayor. Okay. No, I'm good Mike? for now. Yeah, Mayor Lennox, just, just through you and uh, Andrea spoke to this a little bit as it relates to the next steps and uh, kind of our expectations for the applicant. I do think, uh, although we're dealing with the zoning, I think it will be important for council, Andrea, to, to see the site plan concept and have a better understanding of, you know, the landscaping plan, things that are visual that, uh, that obviously they help clarify some of the questions. So we, I would certainly encourage you and, and, uh, ArchCon to give some consideration to providing that level of detail when we bring the zoning bylaw so that council can kind of see the fuller picture um, in, in order to help make their decision. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Mike. If there is nothing further, then uh, I think we'll close off this application and move on to our next uh, application this evening for zoning bylaw public meeting. Thank you everyone for your participation. So we'll move on to our application uh, zoning, zoning by law amendment 21 slash 21. This is for Little Rest Farms Limited. Okay, so just dive into that. The location of the subject land, the land subject to the proposed amendment is described as part lot seven, concession three, with a civic address of 8619 side road seven. The property is 40 hectares in size, and of course the location is shown on the map in your agenda package. Purpose and effect of the application. Uh, purpose and effect of the proposed amendment is to rezone the subject lands from agricultural A zone to site-specific agricultural zone A2. This application is seeking to rezone the retained agricultural portion of the property to prohibit any future residential development. This rezoning is a condition of severance application B16-21 that was granted provisional approval, uh, sorry, provisional approval by Wellington County Land Division Committee. The consent will sever a 1.1 hectare rural residential parcel with an existing dwelling and shed. A 40 hectare agricultural parcel will be retained. Additional relief may be considered at this meeting. How was notice given for this public meeting? So uh, notices were mailed to property owners within 120 meters of the subject lands, as well as to the applicable agencies. Signage was posted on the property on July 29th, 2021. 
Okay, thank you. Um, who's presenting this one this evening? Mike, it's, do you know? Matt is doing this one as well. Okay, Matt. I can't see you yet, but uh, if you're with us, go ahead. Yep, perfect. Thank you through you, Chair. Um, as you had mentioned before you today is the zoning bylaw amendment to rezone the subject lands from agricultural to agricultural site specific. The applicant has received conditional approval on severance application B1621 under the surplus farm dwelling policies. Under these policies, the standard condition is placed that their tame farmlands are rezoned to prohibit uh, future residential. So all in all, the application conforms to the zoning bylaw as well as the official plan and prevention policy and planning staff have no concerns with the application. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, there's no correspondence listed on the agenda for this evening. Has any further correspondence been received in respect to this application? Did we lose Karen? Mike, does that make you the, the clerk? If uh... no, Kathy, Kathy's here. Thankfully, she's oh, uh, much okay. better prepared than I am. <laughs> okay, that's true. I just didn't see her picture for a while, so I kind of forgot that she was with us. Um, yeah, Karen's on, but um, yeah, there's. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Here she is. Yep. Sorry, Karen. Thanks, Mike. So, Karen, we're just looking, wondering if there's any further correspondence. Regard this There's been nothing else received. Sorry. No, that's okay. Well, I was just wondering where what we did if, if uh, we you had lost your connection or something. No, I just had. Anyway, no, nothing yep. else. No, nope. no problem. Okay, anyone uh, wishing to notice of the decision? The bylaw will be considered at the regular council meeting following the public meeting. Persons wishing notice of the passing of the bylaw must submit a written request. And with that, I'll open the, the floor for any questions or comments from the applicant and or the public. Uh, I saw Haley, I think. Hello. Did you want to, did you want to speak to this application, Haley? Um, I don't think I really have anything to add, but just if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Karen, did we have anybody registered to speak on this no, application? We, no, we did not. Okay, thank you. So with that, I'll open the floor for questions, comments from Council. Anybody have any questions or comments on regard to this application? We've seen a few of these before. I have none, Mayor. It looks pretty straightforward. Okay. Me either. Okay. No. Thanks, everyone. So if there's no questions or comments from Council, I don't have any either. We'll move to adjourn the public meeting. And the recommendation here that the public meeting of August 23rd, 2021 be adjourned at 8.43 p.m. Could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by Sherry. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So we're adjourned from the public meeting. And I'll get my paperwork sorted out and we'll go back to the council meeting. Okay, we'll resume our council meeting and I have a recommendation here to do that. The recommendation reads that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North resume the August 23rd, 2021 regular meeting of council at 8.44. Could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by uh, Lisa. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. So we have the bylaws coming out of that uh, um, those public meetings. We have both bylaws on your agenda. Um, I will just read the recommendation for the first one just to get it on the floor. But my recommendation to council will be that we defer that one because it needs uh, further um, discussion and uh, perhaps modification. And then we can move on to the second one. So I'll first let's get it on the floor and then we can move, move to defer it. So I'll read the recommendation. That bylaw number 83-21 being a bylaw to amend bylaw 66-01 being a zoning bylaw for the Township of Wellington North be read a first, second, and third time and enacted. This in regard to part, park lot 9, registered plan 61R7008, 
Part, Part 1, and known municipally as 773 Princess Street, geographic town of Mount Forest, for Archcon Group, Inc. Can I get a mover and a seconder just to get that on the floor, please? Moved by Dan, seconded by Steve. Okay, I would entertain a motion to defer that, that bylaw. Does anyone wish to do that? Moved by Lisa to defer. Could I get a seconder for deferral? Sherry? Okay, and anybody want to discuss deferral of that application any further? Okay, then I'll call the vote. This is uh, voting to defer that um, bylaw. All those in favor of deferral? That's carried, thank you. So that one is deferred. We'll come back at a future meeting. We'll move on to the second bylaw from the second application in the public meeting. And I'll read the recommendation that bylaw number 84-21 being a bylaw to amend bylaw 66-01 being a zoning bylaw for the Township of Wellington North, be read a first, second, and third time and enacted. This is in regard to part lot seven, concession three, with a civic address of 8619 Side Road 7 for Little Rest Farm. Now, can I get a mover and a seconder for that bylaw, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by Dan. I'll open the floor for any discussion on that one. Okay, I'll call the vote then. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, we have a deputation this evening. Uh, Doris Casson, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Is Doris with us, Karen? Doris Cassan, and I do not see her on the list. Um, Doris, if you are signed in as an attendee, if you could just, oh, Irene Lansdowne, just a moment. Hold on, this may be Doris. Just in. Irene, is that... Uh, Are you Doris in disguise? Irene, you're on mute. Yes, hello. Yes, it's Doris. Um, I'm surprised it came up as Irene Lansdowne. That's my Gmail. Okay, so welcome Doris. Uh, Thanks. Uh, if you've been waiting through our council meeting so far, thank you for waiting. Um, thank you for allowing me to come and speak. And yes, I have been listening. Very interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> you have your presentation, so, Doris. Are you going to screen share? No, I did not do a PowerPoint. No. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to talk. I'm surprised that my uh, my face is not coming up there. Yeah, it's just. No, so so far, we've just got a looks like a computer screen with some. Oh, oh, there you are. Oh, there we go. Yay. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, so my name is Doris Cassan. I live with my husband and my son at 116 Schmidt Drive in Arthur. And I'm here to speak about how home fireworks in Arthur have become a problem, in my opinion. I've sent you my deputation request form. I don't know if everyone has read through it. I'm just going to skim through it. Um, but increasingly, I'm noticing anyway, uh, in, the more and more random noisy home fireworks set off in many neighborhoods. Uh, the 2021 Canada Day weekend in particular was pretty bad here on the east side. There were three very loud um, displays, I guess, of firework, although I didn't see anything, I heard it all. Um, and it lasted for, you know, three quarters of an hour, probably. Um, and then again, uh, there, there are other weekends, most weekends, there are fireworks set off here. There was an instance about a month ago at three o'clock in the morning um, of some fireworks being ignited and uh, many people thought it was gunfire. Um, they were, there were comments on the Facebook page for uh, Arthur, what's happening. I think we know that the noise of fireworks is detrimental to the peace 
the peaceful atmosphere of the village. They're, they're disturbing not just to people, but to animals, livestock, uh, livestock pets, wildlife. Um, people with an anxiety or a post-traumatic stress disorder are often triggered by fireworks. You think about people who have emigrated here from um, war-torn countries. I can totally um, identify that July 3rd um, event felt like an assault. Um, the fireworks also release noxious chemicals into the atmosphere that last for quite a while, days in fact, and those chemicals are also deleterious to nature, wildlife, and humans. I uh, attached um, a reference there to the Northern Bruce Peninsula um, news item. They seem to be planning to totally ban fireworks because they've had a lot of complaints about them. I don't know how many complaints uh, this council has received, uh, or I guess it would be the bylaw officer who would receive them um, about fireworks in North Wellington. I looked for some Canadian statistics about um, injury from fireworks and couldn't find anything specifically Canadian, but the International Association of Firefighters states that over 10,000 are injured in Canada and USA every year by fireworks. Uh, the National Safety Council, which is an American site, said that in 2017, eight people were killed um, and over 12,000 injured. 50% were below the age of 20. The same site states that fireworks start an average of 18,500 fires per year. So in the U.S., we usually consider them to be 10 times our population. So even if it was a tenth of that, uh, 1,850 fires per year, that's still a lot. Um, and 75% of ER visits related to sparklers were related to sparklers because sparklers, to my surprise, depends which site you look at. One site says they reach 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, another says 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, that's pretty hot and it's no wonder children are burnt. Um, the further background that I gave you, I talked about how Alberta has, uh, some municipalities have already uh, banned fireworks and they've uh, moved to other things like uh, pyrotechnics um, and um, drone light type uh, displays. Certainly the smoke from fireworks can be comparable to fire or to wildfires and we've seen what that does in our West. Um, there was an incident in Arkansas after a fireworks display where 5,000 blackbirds were dead uh, because they fly up in alarm into the dusk and the gloom and run into things. The Forbes magazine article that I uh, cited talks about how the highly toxic gases and pollutants poison the air, the water, and the soil, making them toxic to all of us. So I don't know the cost of doing a change to the bylaw, um, but that would be my request that um, certainly it would be preferable to ban fireworks as they are doing in the Northern Bruce Peninsula. That may not be palatable to the public, but if we can't ban, can we limit the home fireworks to only on statutory holiday weekends and only on one night with provision for a rain date. For instance, um, that it, Saturday would be fireworks and if it rains, then Sunday would be the fireworks. And then nothing on the other weekends. Um, and also we would need to look at the location of home fireworks. Many fireworks around here are ignited in backyards, which as you know, in subdivisions like this, backyards are not very big. Um, there is a recommendation from the International Association of Firefighters that if the fireworks are the ground type display, uh, there should be a distance for, of 35 feet from the fireworks to people. Um, and if they're aerial, then 150 feet. Now I've proposed 40 feet because I don't really know whether they're ground or, or aerial, the, the fireworks that I'm hearing all the time. Um, and, but I'm sure that you know better than that even. Um, and of course, there are approved fireworks displays. 
um, no question about that, and that could still continue. Um, but perhaps those operators could be encouraged to explore um, less harmful types of fireworks or displays that are kinder to the environment and are less noisy. The cost question, um, as far as capital, the only capital or one-time expense I could think of was the researching and writing of the amendment or a, a new bylaw, and an ongoing expense would be enforcement. So I respectfully submit to the council um, and ask you to consider some sort of change to um, how home fireworks are used in North Wellington. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Doris. Um, does council have any questions or comments for clarification at this point? I don't, I don't think I do right now. I don't, Mayor, but uh, I would thank Doris for taking the time. Thank you. Okay, uh, not seeing anybody else with a question at the moment, Doris, I, I too would like to thank you. Yes, I can answer one of your questions. We have had complaints uh, about fireworks from time to time. Um, I, I agree that it probably is pretty disruptive for lots of people. Uh, the big struggle we have often with this type of thing is enforcement because by the time you dispatch someone to try to enforce the issue, uh, the evidence is already gone. So. Mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. uh, finding the right balance of what the appropriate uh, bylaw is and how we can enforce it is the big challenge. And I know that we have looked at it in the past and uh, we'll continue to look at it, but we definitely appreciate you uh, again reminding us of the importance of it. Thank you. I would agree. It's hard to know by the time I get out to the front yard where the sound was coming from. <laughs> yeah. So you can imagine the challenge that our enforcement staff have. Yes. Okay. Any other questions, comments from council at this point? Again, Doris, thank you. And thank you for your patience this evening. We uh, kept you waiting a while. No, that's fine. You, you have the job of having to really think about all that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, with that, I think we'll move on to our adoption of minutes for the council and public meeting from August 9th. Uh, Mayor Lennox? Yes. Uh, that uh, recommendation needs to be amended to include uh, not only the regular meeting of council held on August 9th, but also the public meeting that was held on August 9th. Okay. Have you got that written out that you could read it for us? Yes, so uh, the recommendation that the minutes of the regular meeting of council and the public meeting of council held on August 9th, 2021 be adopted as circulated. Okay, thanks very much, Karen. Could I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by uh, Lisa. Any discussion on those minutes for either the regular meeting of council or the public meeting? Okay, all those in favor then? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, we have next business arising from the previous meeting of council. Uh, this is in regard to a notice of motion I brought forward last meeting. And I'll read the recommendation and be the mover in this case myself. The recommendation is that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North direct staff to undertake a study in respect to land use planning policies related to cannabis operations within the municipality with respect to noise odor, water usage, security, traffic, et cetera. Uh, could I get a seconder for that to get this on the floor for discussion? Move, seconded by Steve. Open the floor for questions, comments. Go ahead, Steve. Excuse me, I think this, uh, this motion is a good one. Um, I think we do have to have something, uh, some sort of a policy, I guess, in place. Um, we've seen what has happened in the past. And if I think we had a, a policy in place before this uh, came before us, we probably might not be in this situation right now that, uh, that we're in with uh, Well Street. So yeah, I, uh, I think uh, getting a, a 
staff to undertake a study would be would be great to be more knowledgeable for myself as well with regards to uh, urban and rural um, settings for uh, these types of, uh, of businesses. Okay, thanks, Steve. I, I would also add that I think it's uh, this kind of a developing area. We you know we started initially with just the regulation under the uh, Health Canada guidelines, and then it's broadened out to different ways that people can cultivate cannabis legally as well. And our policy has not. Uh, um, to date, been able to keep up with all the changes and the challenges associated with enforcement. If inf enforcement is going to fall on our uh, our local community as opposed to Health Canada, and how we deal with that, uh, whether we need to charge additional costs or fee allocate additional fees to do that, I don't know what that looks like. But I would just uh, think it's a good idea for us to ask staff to look at it, maybe even consider a pause on the applications of this nature till we can kind of get our feet under us uh, from a policy perspective. So, Mike, go ahead. Uh, just through you, Mayor, Mayor Lennox, just wanted to comment in terms of um, staff, our, our next steps as it relates to the motion itself. Uh, Curtis is still with us on the call. Uh, he and I've had some conversations about this and I know that uh, our own staff, Karen and Darren, have been working with Curtis and the uh, planning staff in terms of what what we can do and doing some research in terms of what some other communities have done as it relates to the cannabis operations. I, I think our intent at this point would be to bring forward probably an interim, a, dra a draft interim control bylaw for council to consider at one of the upcoming meetings in September um, to give all of our staff, including the planning staff time to research and delve into what the policy is. The interim control bylaw would give us some time uh, to, to address it without having to address applications. We, we're not too concerned about being flooded with applications, but as Councillor McCabe indicated, and as you've stated, Mayor Lennox, our policy hasn't really caught up with what these potential operations can look like, and we need some time to address that. So we've had some discussions, but I, I think Council can anticipate a draft interim control bylaw coming uh, at a future meeting. Okay, thanks Mike. Uh, Steve, I see you had your hand up again. Yeah, I do have a question, but uh, um, Sherry has one as well, so I'll let her go first. Okay, I sudden, oh, there, there she's, I see your hand up, Sherry, sorry. Go ahead. So my question is, is this, um, this request um, is for, um, cannabis operations that would grow. Are we also going to expand it into uh, retail operations as well, or just or just the growing of cannabis operations? Um, my initial intent was really the growing processing uh, side of it. I had not considered the, the retailing side of it at this stage, but uh, it's certainly, Mike, I see you have your hand partly up. Yeah. So just a reminder for council, we, we acknowledge being a willing host for retail. So the focus was on operations. So cultivation, growing, that's what the focus of the, the motion was. And yeah, we, we have established a policy in terms of setback requirements as it relates to, to retail. So the intent was not to revisit that necessarily. But uh, yeah, if that's if that's the intent of council, that we also look at retail, or that there's concerns about retail, but we uh, we haven't heard, seen that necessarily at a staff level. Okay. Sherry, okay. did you want to follow um, up on that? Yes, I did actually. Thank you, Mayor Lennox. Yeah, um, the only reason I question it is because there have I have received uh, some comments about how many retail operations do we actually need in Wellington North where we have uh, a proposal for uh, two in Mount Forest and my understanding is there is uh, going to be two in Arthur. So um, that's fine if it's not included, but I just think that maybe it's something that should be considered if it can be. Okay, um, I'll just maybe we'll continue the discussion, maybe come back to that if we need to, Sherry. 
Dan, I saw you okay, had your hand you. up. Yeah, I was just uh, going to say that that uh, going back to what Mike had said in regards to the retail uh, part of it, maybe that could be included in the in the report that comes back to council, so so that we could have a discussion on that as well at that time. So I'm, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that maybe we just do a a review of our current policy and then we can look at uh, deciding whether we need further revision to that policy and we do that concurrent with with what we're talking about here is that acceptable to yeah i to think, Dan I think and Terry? yeah i think we need to review the whole while we're we're moving forward with with your notice of motion i think we need to review you know what what we have put in place in the past i think we need to put all that together okay and Sherry, just, just a minute, Karen, I see you there. Sherry, is that acceptable to you as well? Yes, I would agree with that. I think that would be an appropriate time to have that discussion as well. Okay. So, Karen, I, I see your hand up, and I'm, I'm thinking process here as well. Uh, my suggestion would be that we probably uh, pass the motion, assuming council is willing to do so, and we give some staff direction to just include a refresh on the retailing side of the bylaw. Is that yes. acceptable? Yes. Is that acceptable also, from a process perspective? That's the correct process. And Curtis may uh, be able to answer this, but I'm not sure that you're allowed to put any more uh, restrictions on locations of cannabis stores that sell. Uh, I, I, it's been a while since we passed that, but I think that the province gave you know spheres where you can't operate and uh, curtis can you speak more to that sure, sure uh, through you mary lennox um yeah mark it's been a couple of years uh we prepared a memo about retail cannabis uh that we shared with the townships and yeah i believe they the province uh, said that if you chose to opt in you, you basically you opted in and uh, I think there were very few restrictions or limits that were put on where they could be located. I think they, they had to be set back from schools or other specific uh, institutional uses. But I think other than that, I, the province's approach has been that the market will determine um, how, how many uh, shops are, are needed. And I think it's something um, other municipalities are seeing that, you know, for instance, in Toronto on Queen Street, there are dozens of shops that have opened um, now time will tell if, if that many are, are um, ultimately required and, and if they last, but um, we can certainly go back uh, as suggested and, and have a look again at, at the rules and provide a, a, an update brief or an update memo of what, um, uh, what the rules are. Okay. Thank you, Curtis. Uh, Steve, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mayor. I'm just going to say, and I'm sure staff will likely do this, and I know it's it's been a couple of years since we uh, put a kind of a policy together, and I remember Karen saying you can't really uh, stop pizza shops from opening up even if they're side by side. I think that was her quote, but uh, we'll, uh, I would suggest maybe staff look at other municipalities, what they are doing so we don't kind of reinvent the wheel. I know it's probably new for a lot of different municipalities as well with the uh, uh, growing operations. So just to see what other um, neighboring municipalities doesn't even have to be in our county, just in, in Ontario, just to see what they're doing or how they're handling. And I'm sure they're yeah. already thought of that already, so. Yeah, I think on the retailing side, it may be just a good idea for us to refresh what the policies are and understand what our role in those policies are uh, at the same time as we're dealing with the, the growing cultivation processing side of it as well. Any other questions, comments from Council? So again, just to be clear in terms of the process, what I'm proposing we do is we pass the motion as is presented and we're giving sta direction to staff to include us an, an update to, on the retailing side of cannabis as well. Okay, any further discussion, anyone? Okay, I'll call the motion then, all those in favor? Any opposed? 
That's, that's carried. Thank you. We're on to items for consideration this evening. Uh, any items for consideration you'd like pulled out? No, Steve, go ahead. Uh, thanks, Mayor. I would like to uh, have a look at 1D. This is the Arthur BMX Skateboard Park Advisory Committee minutes. Yes, thank you. Okay. And then uh, 4B and 5D. 4B, this is the virtual hybrid meetings and 5B, did you say? Sorry, 5D, uh, tree planting. D, tree planting, okay, thank you. Anybody have others they'd like to pull out? Sherry, is that your hand up? Yes, um, I'd like to add to that uh, Councillor McCabe's list to 1B. 1B, that's the B, Mount Forest BIA? Yes, thank you. Okay. Any others, Sherry? Uh, no, the other two I had, uh, Councillor McCabe's already pulled, thank you. Okay. Dan, go ahead. Uh, 6C. C, this is the uh, London Road concerns. Yeah. Okay. Any others? Dan? No. Okay. Lisa, did you have any you wanted pulled? Um, we've got all the four. I have 4B on my list. 4B. Just to yeah. bear with me a second here. 4B, 4B. Yeah, we've got that one already. Okay. Okay, I'm also going to request that we pull 5A. Okay. Any others? Uh, last call for other items? Okay, I'm not seeing any others, so we'll pass all of the other items. The recommendation is that the all items listed under items for consideration on the August 23rd, 2021 council agenda, with the exception of those items identified for separate discussion, be approved and the recommendations therein be adopted. Could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Dan, seconded by Sherry. Uh, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. So we'll go back to 1B. This is the Mount Forest BIA report from August 10th. And I'll read the recommendation that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive the minutes of the Mount Forest Business Improvement Association. Could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Sherry, seconded by Steve. Any discussion specifically on the minutes? I noticed we do have another recommendation here regarding the bikes. So I really just wanted to, sorry, Mayor Lennox, I really just wanted to uh, bring uh, awareness to what the BIA is working on. Um, they're doing some more recruiting, which is great. Um, and one of the concerns that was sent to me as I wasn't able to make the meeting, uh, it doesn't look like it made it to the minute. Um, but wanted to make staff aware and also council aware that they have some concerns with some vehicles that are in public lots that seem to either be uh, either abandoned or what they like to call derelict vehicles. Um, so just wanted to make staff aware of that uh, to see if there was something that could be done uh, about those vehicles. Uh, predominantly, I know there is uh, some vehicles that are concerned about back in the library, the public section there, um, and it looks like back in um, by Foodland that has been taken care of at this time. Uh, so just wanted to make uh, everyone aware of that and um, that we will they will be looking for also uh, somebody to replace Dave for 2022. Um, he helps with the cleaning of the, the main streets and the BIA area. So um, I'm sure if anybody knows of somebody that would like 
uh, that job, the BIA would greatly appreciate any recommendations. And um, as you stated, Mayor Lennox, there's also a recommendation uh, on a project that they did last year. So they're hoping for more participation on that as well. Thanks, Sherry. And just uh, just as a follow-up, uh, are the BIA members aware of the complaint process to deal with the and who to contact with regard to the the derelict vehicle issue? Uh, they probably do, but they had asked that I I bring it forward at the council meeting. So uh, in working with Darren, uh, we'll get that information to them as well. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from Council on this is in regard to the, the recommendation about receiving the minutes at this point? Okay, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. We'll move on to the second recommendation out of that report. And that reads as follows, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North supports the display of gold bikes in downtown Mount Forest during September to support Childhood Cancer Awareness Month. Can I get a mover and a seconder for that one, please? Moved by Sherry, seconded by Lisa. And we'll open the floor for discussion on that. Nobody wants to talk. I would say this is a great initiative and I, I'm very supportive of it, but please go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, so this initiative, uh, the downtown um, group uh, for Mount Forest, which is an umbrella uh, committee under the BIA, started this last year. Uh, it was uh, a, it was uh, great. It was during COVID, brought some real awareness to um, uh, a family that's that's in need. Uh, their son is going through some treatment. So very supportive of this, this project and uh, hope that there is more involvement uh, this year. Great. Thanks, Sherry. Any other comments, questions? Well, thanks. Thanks. Uh, please pass on our thanks to the BIA for leading this initiative, Sherry. Uh, I think we can all relate to the importance of uh, childhood cancer and doing what we can to try to reduce that. So, or, or at least find ways to keep kids uh, healthy and uh, active. I will do that. Uh, call Thank the, you. Uh, call the motion then. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. So we're on to 1D now. It's in regard to the BMX Skateboard Park Ad Hoc Advisory Committee, July 7, 2021. The recommendation reads that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive the minutes of the Arthur BMX Skateboard Park Ad Hoc Advisory Committee meeting held on July 7, 2021. Can I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by Lisa. And I'll open the floor for questions, comments. Steve, I bet you got something to say here. I do, but uh, I, and I will. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I will pass uh, it over to uh, to Lisa after I've uh, said my little bit here. I think this is great news that the Lions are going to move ahead with this um, without funding from the township. Uh, it proves their commitment to the uh, the project they've had on the go for a bit. It's been trying times for them to raise the money that is needed, but they're going to build what they can. And I think it's going to be a great start. And uh, we're going to have a meeting uh, tomorrow as well uh, in the uh, pavilion in Arthur and uh, discuss it a little bit further. So good news for um, the BMX park. And it's just going to be uh, a great addition to the splash pad and the pool and the uh, Optimus's uh, playground and uh, pavilion that's already there. So with that, I think Lisa actually might want to say a few words to this as well. Yeah, I, d I don't know what to add, um, Steve. Uh, may maybe I should just elaborate in the, on this because actually in the minutes, it, it does, does note um, approaching the township and kind of getting a, a loan for a portion of it. Since that happened, uh, since that was discussed and came to rec committee 
Um, I believe the majority of the Lions watched the Rec Committee com meeting and, and had a very lengthy discussion about taking out kind of a long-term loan and uh, decided against that and that they would pay, you know, kind of uh, whatever they could afford um, was what's going to have to happen and, and maybe in stages or something like that. So we're going to have a meeting tomorrow to kind of uh, discuss that a little bit further. But um, at this point in time, um, they're just willing to just keep plugging away at it, selling lots of chicken dinners. So I hope everyone <laughs> comes to pick those up. And there's quite a, a lot of things that they're planning, um, quite a number of things um, with, you know, what they can do. Um, the fundraising really has been a problem with COVID-19 and they believe in working for their money and, uh, you know, providing value to the community, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's hard to go and ask for money right now, but uh, I admire them. They work so hard. They work so hard and they're very devoted to this and, and very passionate about it. Um, and they, I don't know whether anyone has mentioned it, but they have actually come with, up with a name for the park. So, um, I was hoping you would tell us. <laughs> I have to make sure I can get it right, but I believe it's, um, well, it's in honor of Brent Barnes. So it, it would be the Brent Barnes Memorial uh, Park. That's probably not exactly correct. I could maybe get better, better wording so I can get it exact, but, uh, yeah, so um, in honor of him, and it was his idea, and it was his passion, and they're going to get it done. Great, Lisa. Any other questions, comments? Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I, I guess after the meeting, uh, I talked to Steve briefly uh, in regards to some, I guess, various, uh, I don't know what I'd call it, maybe, uh, fundraising ideas or, or support ideas uh, from the township. Uh, Steve and I haven't had the opportunity to really get together to to uh, hammer out the details, but we are going to try to bring something forward here in the next little while in regards to um, this project. Is there anything else, Steve, in that regard? Anything else you want to add to that? Yeah, if, you, if through you, Mayor, if you don't mind. Go ahead. And then, and thanks, uh, Councillor Yake, for, for bringing that up as well. Um, Dan and I talked about this, and it brought to light a, um, a situation that I think has made itself evident just because of the pandemic that we're in, and it makes it extremely hard for our community service clubs to fundraise and, and help our community. And they do a, a hell of a lot for us. Um, yes, we take over the... Uh, uh, facilities that they uh, help build. Um, but I guess one of the, the lasting points that Dan and I kind of thought was we, we want more of this kind of stuff going on in our, uh, in our townships where the community groups um, come up with an idea to build something that the township wouldn't do. Um, and then I think that's the, the very essence of community groups. And we got thinking is what we got thinking was if if we can't help community groups uh, by giving them grants, if they need it, especially during the situation that the whole world is in right now, we won't have any community groups left to do this kind of work that the township probably doesn't have any need to be in. Um, so yeah, Dan and I are gonna uh, um, work on something and then uh, bring that forward to a, a future uh, meeting of council. Thanks. Um, I just would like to uh, commend the Lions for their um, perseverance through the challenges that we're having currently. Uh, and while it may be disappointing that they couldn't build it all at once, I think it may be a good catalyst actually to help with the fundraising if people see that there's something happening, but there's more to come. And uh, I, the, the challenge of building uh, fundraising for something after it's already built, I think. Uh, could be significant. Uh, we've seen that in the past and uh, I think maybe a, a starter project uh, and then follow it up uh, maybe just as successful or more successful in doing it all at once. So again I thank them for their perseverance and yes I will be getting my chicken dinner tickets.
You buy Lisa, it? go ahead. Um, okay, I see, see, I'll take that challenge. I'll buy di chicken dinner tickets for everybody. Next time it's on you. <laughs> Lisa, go ahead. Uh, I just wanted to correct myself. It is officially the Brent Barnes Memorial Skateboard Park. And I'd also like to give a shout out to those amazing kids in Arthur that are raising money for this. So thumbs up to them. Yeah, thanks for that, Lisa. Any other questions, comments? Okay, I'll call the motion then. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. And we'll move on to, I believe it's 4B, is that right, Karen? Uh, I thought someone had called, no. No, you're right, it's 4B. Okay, this is the uh, uh, report in regard to hybrid in-person virtual meetings. Mike? Mar Mary Lennox, just before you, you move on, and it may have not gotten pulled, but uh, Cal Davis has been on, and he's his report is 2A, so I, I, I know this is out of order, but I would appreciate if you'd give Kyle maybe an opportunity just to give an overview on his report for Council. Sure. Uh, what a patient man, Kyle. We didn't pull it for discussion because we uh, trust in the work you're doing, but uh, we'd be happy to have an update. Thank you very much, uh, very much, Mayor Lennox. You can, uh, hopefully you can hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I will be brief. Um, the report in front of you is just an information report for Council in regards to um, an update to the Saugeen Valley Source Protection Plan. Um, if you recall, there was a similar report uh, about a year and a half ago on updates to the Grand River, uh, the Grand River Plan, uh, which uh, impacts, which covers Arthur. The Saugeen Valley Plan covers uh, Mount Forest. Um, so we are in a pre-consultation period right now uh, with uh, with this plan. Uh, the Conservation Authority is uh, as is uh, uh, leading this work, um, and this is a provincially initiated amendment. Um, so that means that there's not a requirement for a council resolution, uh, but more that it's uh, this is more information report. So the majority of the amendments are regarding uh, road salt um, and uh, salt storage. Uh, as well as some uh, some changes to, to fuel uh, thresholds and overall staff is in support of the uh, of the proposals and this will be moving to public consultation sometime in the fall, which is also why we wanted to get this in front of Council just so that you're aware uh, when the public consultation period starts just that, uh, um, that that you're aware ahead of that uh, that this was coming. Happy to take questions if, if there are any. Okay, thanks Kyle. Anybody have any questions? Regard to that, we've already approved the uh, recommendation, but anybody have any questions? I'm good, thank you. Okay, doesn't look like we have any, Kyle. So thank you for your thoroughness. No problem. And your Thanks. patience. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. Okay, so we'll go move to 4B. Uh, We've got a fairly lengthy recommendation here. This is in regard to uh, report TR 2021-13 being reported on the Kenilworth Council Chambers and ability to host hybrid in-person virtual meetings. So I'll read the recommendation. Uh, sorry if I'm droning on, it's just there's a lot here. So that, that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North received report TR 2021-13 being reported on the Kenilworth Council Chambers and ability to host hybrid in person slash virtual meetings and further the council direct staff to implement necessary measures to enable hybrid meetings including purchasing an additional piece of conferencing equipment that will enable integration between both digital mediums and analog mediums and further that all necessary changes modification to the existing technologies to enable hybrid meetings are to be funded from the safe restart funding allocation by our provincial partners to facilitate this initiative could I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by Sherry. And uh, I see Adam's picture up here, so it looks like he's ready for us to hit him with questions. So everybody, let's go. <laughs> Any questions for Adam, though, on a serious note? 
<clears throat> Steve, go ahead. I was actually going to get him to uh, explain kind of in person uh, and elaborate <laughs> a little bit more. Um, uh, good idea. And, uh, um, hopefully his, uh, his feed is good so we can hear him. I'll do my best. Have you, can I, am I coming across clear? Yeah, go ahead. Very good. Thank you. And I'll take some of the blame for the long winded recommendation, Mayor Lennox. I think that was mostly my <laughs> doing. Um, it's just been a long night. That's all. Very good. Uh, appreciated. <laughs> I'll try to keep it brief, Mayor Lennox. And through you, uh, really what this is, uh, is just a report giving an update in terms of some of the council upgrades that have transpired over the last few years uh, that really haven't been able to get the, the enjoyment that they deserve. Uh, the entire council chambers has had a fairly substantial refresh in terms of the technologies and audio system and video system for that matter. Um, regrettably though, when it was designed, we were all in an in-person format. So it was really just designed to record and basically amplify the audio within the council chambers so that we could post the council sessions um, to our website after the fact. Uh, so when we were going to the market to look for alternatives that would enable both a mix of in-person and remote attendance. Uh, we realized that we were absent one piece of equipment which would make that uh, a reality uh, for the township. Um, that one piece of equipment, really what it does is takes the analog feed that's being created through the amplification within the, the Kenilworth chambers uh, and converts it to a digital format so that we could integrate that with a Zoom or a Teams type meeting. So really what we would need to do is purchase an additional piece of equipment that decodes the analog signal, converts it to a digital signal so that we can have both in-person and remote people um, kind of chiming in uh, to the council chambers within the Kenilworth uh, location. Okay, thanks Adam. Karen, I see you have your hand up as well. Yeah, so um, uh, just so we're clear, when when we move to this, because the, the Zoom meetings are great in that it allows public participation, they don't have to be there because our council chambers really isn't big enough right now, but what you need to realize is it, when we move to this right now, everybody has their own video box when we move to this and we're in the council chambers everybody at that council table will be in one zoom box so uh you know when you look around the table and it, it won't right now if someone's speaking your zoom box lights up it won't it won't do that it'll it won't zoom into you because we're all going to be on that same box. Okay. Steve? When are you thinking of uh, moving forward to this? And, um, and I know there's not much out there in the marketplace to uh, have a better format or platform for this other than what's uh, recommended. Um, I guess when when would you when would we I guess at at the earliest when would we be able to set this up and implement it and can Mike? we test run it first? So I'll I'll answer the last question first. We will absolutely test run it first, uh, <laughs> Councilor McCabe. That was a lob probably, to you, probably, uh, Mike. Probably more than once. Um, that was a lob ball to you. Uh, uh, my expectation around this, and uh, the mayor and I have, have spoken about this a little bit. We've seen, uh, and you've all seen, some uh, councils coming back and getting back to in-person meetings. I have no intent at this point, because of the size of our council chambers and because of how well uh, these meetings have gone, I don't plan on pushing the envelope uh, to get the, us back into the council chambers that quickly. So. Uh, I wouldn't envision it probably until December at the earliest, but probably more likely not until the new year that we would be in a position to test and, and go to the hybrid model. Um, I think we're still going to be in a state where we're still in stage three uh, for a while. And um, I don't, while we're in stage three, I think I would still be an advocate for us remaining in the format that we currently are taking with our meetings. Thank you. 
Any other questions, comments? Sherry, go ahead. So this piece, this uh, piece of equipment that we need, is this something that we need once we move past these Zoom meetings? Or is this just to sort of facilitate hybrid meetings while we're, store, while we're still in stage three and COVID, COVID pandemic? Karen, did you want to? Or... No, no, I'm going to let Mike speak to that. Okay. So, um, Councillor Burke, I, I think the intent uh, from a staff perspective and in conversations that, again, that I've had with the mayor, the idea of us returning back to what we normally would in terms of being in Kenilworth as one big fell swoop may never return. And we're planning on that. Um, a lot of things that we've learned through the pandemic is that uh, Kyle Davies, as an example, or the planners or the consultants, having the ability for them to participate electronically and other staff uh, participate electronically and people who have accessibility issues being able to participate electronically makes a lot of sense going forward to continue on in whatever format we can to allow that. I know we all want to get back to a certain degree. I, I get that. But I think the hybrid model is something that we envision happening uh, in perpetuity going forward because it is advantageous in a lot of ways from an accessibility standpoint and from staff travel standpoints. And th there's a lot of advantages to it. The challenge is making it work and we're making it work seamlessly, which uh, we will try. Um, but uh, Adam and Karen's report kind of suggests that, um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, trial and error that's potential as part of that. But that's, that is the direction that we are currently headed. So with that being said, I would say there's, you know, we as council can choose to move back to an in-person format, but there are quite a number of other, if I could put it this way, cast of characters who provide us information and feedback that having the ability to do this hybrid model will actually facilitate. So, well, we may be getting sick of the Zoom meetings and not being able to get together and, and exchange, uh, you know, inappropriate stories or appropriate stories or whatever they are, um, uh, we still need the ability to include people even after that time comes back. And, uh, Karen? So the intent uh, could even be the council can be in that council chambers and, you know, maybe the clerk and, and the CAO, uh, but having the ability to do these hybrid meetings provides the public the opportunity to participate in them. If we go over our, um, uh, you know, our numbers of people who are, you know, on the on on the live meeting, it's you know quite often it's uh, more people watching this meeting live than we would ever be able to accommodate in our council chambers. And if we go back just to the in-person meeting, uh, we lose all of that. And um, anyway, that's... Uh, okay, Dan? So just back to your comments, Mike, are you, are, are you, you support this hybrid model or you're, or you wanna stay kind of in the same situation we are for another uh, little while. I, I didn't really kind of get, get that from your sure. comments. Yeah, to clarify, Dan, I, I think we will remain in the Zoom model probably to, to, to the balance of the year, and then we would transition to the hybrid afterwards. Okay. Uh, now, if, if we move more quickly out of uh, stage three, then maybe maybe my mindset will change a little bit, but I do think it will take time for our staff to figure out how the hybrid works. So we need that time anyways. So yeah, uh, I guess the short answer is, yeah, I think we need to remain in the Zoom style and format that we've we've been gotten accustomed to over the last 19 months, uh, at least probably through the end of the year. And then 
hopefully in the new year we would be implementing the hybrid model which would have some of us yep back in the room together but still afford other people to participate electronically or virtually i guess is the better word go ahead dan so then how do we then just uh, uh commit i guess is the right word maybe to just staying with zoom till the end of the year so that we know we all know that that's how we're gonna we're gonna you know we're not gonna change in november yep. we're, we're just gonna like what is it gonna take for is that gonna have to come from you to say listen i want to commit to zoom meetings till the end of the year and then we'll proceed um start to move forward in a, in a in another way like so, just so we I'm know I'm just going to jump in a little bit here, Mike. And the, so council meetings are our meetings as members of council. If we want to change the format at any time, we can as a group. Right. Okay. Um, but given the circumstances and looking after public safety and safety of our staff, I think what Mike's saying is that we probably need to stay in this at least while we're in stage three, maybe longer, and then there may be an additional period of time to put the materials in place and and test it. If we if this council feels strongly that we need to move to a different format, then let's let's have that conversation and get on with it. If we're okay with continuing with this format for the meantime while we get another format in place then we carry on as, as we are. Yeah, I'm not saying, I'm not saying change it. I'm just saying, let's, let's have that discussion. Do uh, the five of us can vote. I don't know how we, you know, to, to, to say we're going to stay. If everybody's happy with the zoom meetings till the end of the year, then we know that that's what we're going to do. And in the meantime, Adam and Mike and Karen and everybody else that's involved, can work towards getting us prepared to go to the hybrid model. I'm just saying, just so we know, and that we're not going to be possibly changing in October or November. I'm, I'm ready to say uh, I'm okay with staying with Zoom meetings till the end of the year. Okay. So, um, do you want to amend the motion to include that, Dan? Well, we, if we could, and then then we know we know what we're, the status of the meeting schedule is going to be till the end of the year. Okay, Mike, Mayor Lennox, the only, the only comment I would make, and Councillor Yeg, I appreciate the. I think everybody uh, on the call, including staff, would appreciate the certainty. So I I appreciate you bringing you know kind of saying let's make the decision. Uh, there is a little uncertainty around stage three and how long that is by amending the motion mayor lennox how do we address that and do we really want to address that maybe you know at this point if the members of council are comfortable with giving direction to staff as opposed to amending the motion that we're going to continue and it the onus falls on me that if things change and we need to make an alteration to the end of year date then i need to come back to council with that um but I, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm worried yeah. about amending the motion just because there is a level of uncertainty. Well, I, I guess I'll put it to other members of council. Is everybody comfortable with proceeding as Dan has proposed and we give that as direction to staff or do we want to take a hard and fast vote on it? Sherry, go ahead. Yeah, so um, I'm really okay either way. My question was more directed to the fact that um, the funds and the equipment, whether it was going to be an ongoing thing, because I don't really, I guess I don't know enough about the technical side of, uh, of things uh, for this project. And uh, so I just wanted to ensure that if we're going to put these dollars out there, that the equipment is going to be used on an ongoing basis. Um, I'm okay with giving direction to staff um, to extend it, as Councillor Yake has said, uh, but there's, uh, there's also some uncertainty with that. As we know, numbers keep climbing. So 
I think there need, there needs to be some flexibility. Okay. Councillor Hearn, Councillor McKay, would you like to weigh in? Sorry, thank you. I'm just trying to take myself off of mute. It's it's pretty much a moving target, um, and I, you know, how do you, how do we know what's going to be coming in the next months or half a year or a year? Um, I'm kind of all right with being patient and see where we go, and and uh, as Mike said, maybe not even putting um, this hybrid into play until the new year. Um, and you know, and, and see what goes on before we even spend the money. So, I, uh, I like I like this um, format where we're at Zoom uh, meetings. I know, um, like you said earlier, Karen, that uh, there's quite a bit of participation from the public, and uh, more public are able to see it. Maybe not live, but uh, they can snip through uh, the YouTube channel and, and see it whenever they want, which I think is a huge advantage that we may or may not have had in the past before this. And it's, it's kind of like a, a 50 50. Do you do it or do you not do it? Um, I, uh, I think I can. I'm all right, wait until December and, and not putting any money out yet as well. Not a very clear answer. <laughs> Thanks for that, Steve. Lisa? Yeah, I, yeah, it is such a moving target. I wish I had a crystal ball. Um, yeah, I don't believe in, you know, a hard and fast line is necessarily the right way to go, just maybe a direction to staff. But I did have a question that I was trying to ask a few times, but... Uh, Sorry about that. Uh, no, that's okay. I'm patient. So um, <laughs> with this, like, let's say we get into January, we move forward with this and God forbid I get COVID-19, and but I still don't feel too bad. Will this give me the opportunity to still be able to participate in a council meeting from my so, bedroom. <laughs> so I, I, I'd like to tackle that one first, Lisa, and I would suggest that that's up to us. We as council will have to make that decision, whether we insist on people being present in the chamber or whether we will continue to allow electronic participation. So I, I think that's completely on us. I think the technology will allow us to do a hybrid meeting where one person can, you know, uh, participate from a remote location or from their home or whatever that is. Um, but it, it's up to us as council to decide what we're willing to tolerate and what we want for our meetings, because they are our meetings. Did you have anything else, Lisa? Sorry, it's on my, probably went on a tirade there. Uh, not really. I mean, it. I mean, there are other things that stem off of that and advantages. I think we had to cancel a count, council meeting a couple of couple of years ago. The last time, one of the last times we met in person due to the weather, and you know, this could be, you know, another another way to uh, avoid that from happening again. Yeah, Steve. I was going to <clears throat> kind of piggyback on uh, on what Councillor Hearn said as well, and I think tonight is a, a prime example of uh, using a not a hybrid, but uh, using technology to uh, so we can all meet across uh, the different uh, areas that we are in. I know you're uh, you're away on holidays, Mayor, and if uh, any one of us were away on a vacation or uh, work related, it'd be it'd be interesting. I think this format has allowed us to. Uh, participate legally in a in a meeting of council or a committee or uh, you know uh, wherever we need to gather and I think it's I think that's the whole importance of hybrid or zoom meetings or in person is is the fact that we are able to get to get together and talk out issues so how we how we get there is uh, is is important but uh, if we can get there I think going forward using this kind of a format hybrid or just zoom i think is utmost important as well and i think it will allow us some flexibility if, uh, in the future as well if i'm not in the province for work i can still um, get in on the meeting no matter where you are 
Yeah, and I, I agree with you, Steve. My only concern around some of this is, um, and my hat's off to all of you, both members of council and staff, in that we've made this work. It's not as easy as being in person. And I think we've made it work pretty well. And that all goes to all of you. Um, but I think we also need to be aware that this, you, not not always is everybody as cooperative as we've experienced here in the, in this group in this time. And I think we have to be careful about what we set up for the future too, so that we don't create conflicts that uh, if you didn't have a council and a staff team that were as cooperative and as willing to give and take to make it work. So um, let's not forget what we have and be grateful for it. And I am very grateful for all of you and your willingness to adapt and, and be flexible. But I, I think we need to be careful about what uh, expectations we set. Now, we don't have to decide anything tonight about that. I just throw that out there because I think it's important to consider for the future. Karen? So I think, I'm not sure. So we either have to do strictly Zoom or strictly in-person or a hybrid. So it's not, you know, let's do Zoom now and let's try in person and then we'll go to a hybrid. So I think that's what the decision tonight is. This this piece of equipment and, and Mike has indicated that, you know, the Zoom meetings uh, have improved accessibility for our rate payers, uh, you know, for our consultants and things like that. Um, and so, you know, the intent is to do a hybrid meeting so that maybe all maybe council will put in their procedure bylaw that all of council has to be in person but the hybrid piece of it will enable the public to zoom in the consultants to zoom in or a council can say all right every counselor can remotely access a meeting four times a year i mean Mayor Lennox is right, it is your meeting and you can decide what you want to put in your procedure bylaw. Um, but if we don't, if we don't get this additional piece, uh, pretty much uh, you've decided that it's going to be in person meetings. Because without this piece, we can't do a hybrid. Okay. Yeah, and, I, and I'm sorry if I'm taking us off track, I just wanted to uh, make the point about, you know, we have to decide what meeting format we want and what that looks like. And I, I am sensing that everybody's in favor of proceeding with the hybrid meeting model. And I think that's great. And I think, I think from what the feedback I'm getting, we can give direction to, to look at when we switch to the hybrid model, but to try to have some sort of clarity around that. Um, I did have one question I wanted to ask Adam, so thank you for waiting patiently. Uh, one of the questions I had was uh, with regard to if we go, if council were to be back in the chambers in person and we needed to continue to maintain the physical distance between each other, will this technology still allow people to be able to see and hear members of council even though we're spread far apart? I believe that would be doable, uh, Mayor Lennox. I think the issue then becomes uh, the optics of it all, uh, just in terms of the visual, um, how you get all individuals of council in front of a camera when you're socially distanced becomes a little bit uh, of a, a hurdle um, because we only have one camera within council chambers and it's only got a, a certain uh, field of view, if you will. Um, so in terms of uh, the visual side of things, that might become a little bit cumbersome, but I'm certainly happy to take that away and report back. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Okay, so I think if, if council approves this, I think what the, we're proceeding with the hybrid model and we've given direction to staff to try to be more clear about when we're going to make the switch and, and set a, within reason, set a time frame to get on with it. And I think the message I'm hearing is that uh, we continue with this till the end of the year at least, and then uh, look at the hybrid uh, beyond that. So 
before we wrap it up, I'll just give it, everybody another opportunity to comment on my attempted summary and uh, we'll go from there. Any questions, comments? I'm good, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Okay, so I'll call the motion then. All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. Okay, we're on to 5A. And fairly lengthy recommendation here. So recommendation reads as follows. Uh, the Council of the Corporation of the Count Township of Wellington North received for information report CLK 2021-023 being a report on a request for abandonment of the Smith Drain Branch Fee under Section 84 of the Drainage Act and further that the Council approve the abandonment of the Smith Drain Branch Fee under Section 84 of the Drainage Act and further the staff be directed to bring a bylaw to Council authorizing a bylaw to, re to repeal bylaw 1089 dash 1698 after the appeal period is ended and further that the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute the bylaw can i get a mover and a seconder for that please moved by lisa seconded by sherry and since i'm the one that pulled it i'm going to ask my question we can get on with it unless somebody has anything else and this is a question for you karen i assume that all the landowners apportioned under this drain are agreeable to the abandonment of it and if so, how does, if not, how does that work? So Neil uh, Morris, our uh, drainage engineer from Case Smart, is, has been patiently waiting. I know he's got a baby that's probably uh, <laughs> needing to get to bed, but um, I'm going to uh, defer that question to Neil. Okay. Neil, if you're with us. Um, at, at this point, this is the purpose of this notice is to send out to everyone uh, in the water or to the adjacent landowners. And if they are in agreement, um, the next step would be to abandon it. If they're not in agreement, they can send a notice um, to council uh, to, through the clerk to uh, ask for an engineer's report. So, um, we, we also have to, this notice that will go out, will have to be very specific to which areas are to be abandoned, which areas aren't. Um, and that's something that I've been working with the, your, the drainage superintendent Garth Necker on. So we were working together on this one. So that makes sense. Okay. Uh, I'm just struggling with the recommendation a little bit because it sounds like we're already agreeing to abandon it. No, you're not. A, Agreeing to abandon at this point, it's actually a notice to be sent out to um, members in the watershed to notify that there is a plan to abandon three to abandon sections or the whole drain. Okay, so just as a follow up, does it only take one landowner to request the abandonment? Uh, no, uh, we need seventy five percent of the benefiting lands. Uh, the owners of the benefiting lands to 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 go through this process. Okay, thank you, Karen. If you don't approve the abandonment of the drain, that by approving the abandonment of the drain, it triggers us sending out the letters, which then triggers the notice period. So if you don't agree to abandon the drain, then we don't send out the letters so it's, it's like a triggering mechanism once if, if anybody objects in the objection period uh that then a report would need to be written and it just the process continues on okay yeah just from the wording in the resolution it doesn't that's not wasn't clear to me so thank you for the clarification i assume this applies to the second one as well yes right Steve, go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so what happens if by chance um, we turn this down and say, no, we've got to leave the municipal, that part of the municipal drain open and the drain's already been backfilled? Um. I, I, I don't think you're allowed to do that to a municipal no. drain. There, there no. will be consequences for doing that, correct, Neil? 
Yes, uh, what you would have to do uh, through the drainage superintendent would we, we would be um, obligated to uh, put it back to as the original bylaw and open it up at the owner's expense. That would be the statutory requirements. And at this point, we're trying to get away from that process. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay, so just to be 100% clear, if we have any objections, this is coming back to this table. Yes. If, if the landowners have any objections. Right, the, the affected landowners. If any of the affected landowners object, and I'm assuming the notice that they get will be clear about that as well? Correct. Okay. And nothing has been sent out to the joining neighbors at all right now? No, not at this point. Okay. Just and, curious, thank you. And further to that, um, even if we don't hear anything back from them, it will still have to go to council to repeal the bylaw. So um, we, there, there's one more council meeting required in any case. Okay. To actually do the physical abandonment of the uh, repeal the original bylaw. And, and it, it okay. says in the resolution that staff be directed to bring the bylaw to council to repeal after the appeal period has ended. So if we get appeals during that 10 day appeal period, the repealing bylaw would not be brought back to council until the engineer report had been prepared. Okay, well, I, I thank you for the clarification because that was not at all clear to me, so. And, okay. Did you have something further, Steve? Yeah, just a quick follow up. Sorry, maybe not, I didn't hear. So would Garth Necker, uh, go out and have a look at these drains before uh, the next meeting or how does that work uh, Neil? Um, he has already taken a look at them. Uh, we've already had a number of discussions um, previously with the landowners um, so uh, we've done a lot of consultation already so we don't okay. think there'd be a there'd be an extensive process but we still have to do this this step to abandon a drain. So. Okay thank you. Thank you. And correct thank you. me if Correct me if I'm wrong, Neil, but I think they want to fill the, they want to abandon the drains so that they can tile drain to make a better use of, of the land. That is what I've been told by Garth, yes. <clears throat> okay, any other questions on this? Okay, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. So now we're on to 5D, I guess it is. Or this is the CAO report, tree planting urban areas. And I'll read the recommendation that That's the Council 5D. of the Corporation. 5D. Sorry? 5D. 5D. Oh, sorry. Did I say four? You said B, I think. I don't know. It's getting late. Oh. I think you said B. It's 5D. <laughs> okay. Sorry. That, so the recommendation reads that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive report CAO 2021-005 being a report on tree planting urban areas. And further, the Council of the Township of Wellington North directs staff to pursue the identified recommendations as follows. Number one, Council to endorse an annual Township of Wellington North tree planting day for staff and Council partnering with Green Legacy and or others and plant trees in and around Earth Day, April 22nd on suitable township owned lands, along trails or vacant green space, et cetera. Council to endorse partnering with Wellington North Power on an incentive program to have customers moving to e-billing to reduce reliance on paper billing for electricity, water and wastewater customers. Number three, council direct staff to investigate e-billing opportunities for property tax bills to further reduce reliance on paper billing. And number four, council endorsed township staff pursuing a partnership with the county on a neighborhood tree planting program. I need a mover and a seconder for that, please. Moved by Sherry, seconded by Dan. Uh, open the floor for discussion. Steve? Yeah, I think this is uh, uh, a most suitable recommendation based on um, uh, um, the lady that brought this deputation to us a, a couple of weeks ago, there a couple of meetings ago. I, uh, I like the idea of this. Um, the only thing I might have a little bit of a problem with is um, 
uh, e-billing. Um, I know there's a lot of seniors in the area and we have a lot of Mennonites in the area that may not, um, well, I guess we don't, I guess the Mennonites probably wouldn't be on Wellington North Power, but it's just the e-billing part of it. I understand that and I have e-bills as well for uh, Ontario Hydro or Hydro One. I uh, just want to make sure that there's a availability for people to still receive paper bills if they aren't able to get uh, their e-bills. Other than that, I think this is great, and uh, I think it's great for the uh, for the township as well. Mike, did you want to address that? Uh, yeah, certainly. I'll I'll try, uh, Councillor McCabe. The e-billing piece, Wellington North Power has has made a transition that they can offer that as an option. But yeah, there still is there still is the provision that you can get your bill mailed to you. Um, uh, there was a bit of conversation um, that I've had with staff at Wellington North Power that they were hoping for ways to try and incent it. So that that was part of the ideas. Yep. You know, some people just need that little push to move to e-billing, but certainly, yeah, we recognize the demographic sure. exists within our community that, yeah, we're still going to need to do paper billing um, for many, and um, that's fine. Yeah, great. Thank you. Okay. Sherry, I think I saw your hand up, didn't I? Yes. So um, I just wanted to say that I think this is a great start. Uh, I like the environmentally friendly aspect and the fact that um, people will be able to opt in or opt out of the e-billing. Um, my, I have some questions around point four, um, the partnership with the county and the neighborhood tree planting program. Um, I'm interested to see how that all rules out if there's any information on that. Um, as I know um, from past conversations at council with regards to tree planting, there are several people that are very interested in becoming volunteers of any kind of committee or group that's formed out of these discussions. So would just really like to be kept up to date on what that entails. Um, is this sort of a new, I am going to direct this question to Mike, is this neighborhood tree planting program a new initiative through the county? And my follow up to that would be the financial considerations at $500 a tree. Um, I think we need to do some shopping around and I go back to the tree that I purchased to put on my front yard. Um, it's a lot taller than the one that's being considered and uh, was less expensive. Mike, do you want to tackle that? I sure. think Councillor Hearn has her hand up. I will let you go. Yeah, through you, uh, Mayor Lennox. Yeah, Councillor Burke, within the body of the report, it speaks to the real application of what the neighborhood uh, tree planting program is. And part of my so thinking around around this is that um, in order for trees to flourish they need to go to the people that want the trees so that's part of my thinking and part of my recommendation is that we make trees available to the people that want them and want them on their properties uh, we all know uh, all of us as members of council and all of us of staff know that trees can become a major nuisance issue between neighbors so I want to make sure that we have a program that doesn't just have trees being planted, uh, assuming that people are going to take care of them and assuming that people want them. Uh, the I intent of the program is to identify people who want trees and who are going to take care of them and maintain them and provide an incentive around that. The pricing around piece, that's the hope of working with a green legacy program. Uh, as we know, the county has a very, very elaborate tree growing program um, and any way that we can tap into that further uh, within the urban area, which I was told was the gap that we're trying to address, I think is great. And that's the intent of the neighborhood tree planting program is to try to address the urban gap. Uh, the piece about uh, groups wanting to plant, uh, I would say the first bullet would be a great opportunity for them to become part of that. Um, talking about uh, an annual township tree planting day for staff and council. Um, I think the groups that you're speaking of, it would be great to involve them as well as part of that. Uh, 
Okay, uh, Lisa, I'm going to let Sherry follow up, and I'll come back to you. Go ahead, Sherry. Oh, okay, so under so under financial consideration, it says costs associated with subsidizing suitable trees would need to be established in an annual budget. Recent tree purchases would suggest uh, seven to eight foot trees cost in the neighborhood of five hundred dollars per tree. So that is part of the subsidized program that you're speaking of, Mike. That would be for people that want to plant trees, that want actually want to have trees on their property. Is that correct? Right. So the intent would be to try to work with Green Legacy. I'm not sure if that's uh, possible yet that this is what we're looking for the endorsement from council or work with a another we within our borders we know there are areas where you can purchase trees uh, um, and we would basically the township would subsidize the overall cost of the tree making it even more appealing to the person who wanted the tree so let's say sherry in your example the tree only cost two hundred dollars well, maybe the township mm -hmm. would cover 50% of that cost to allow that person to purchase that tree. That's the intent of the okay. subsidized report. Not, and we've, we've kind of gone through this example. The, the mayor had the example of uh, posting his kittens on Kijiji. If you give them away for nothing, uh, sometimes people treat them like nothing. If there's a program that subsidizes it, Maybe you're going to get the people who actually want the trees and are going to maintain the trees because they're invested in it too. It's it's a two-way partnership. Okay, uh, I I agree with that. I just think we if that's the price on the trees, then we need to do some shopping around. That's I that's I have done zero shopping zero, but I can Perfect. tell you we purchased trees uh, in support of a development property that we owned, and that was the price we paid. But we have not shot. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, Lisa. Sorry, I didn't want to unmute. Um, yeah, my questions kind of and comments kind of go back to that section. Um, you did quote approximately five hundred dollars for a seven to eight foot tree, and then you talked about a four to five foot tree. So I, I'm assuming that's kind of what you're proposing going forward with is a four to five foot, not necessarily that big. Um, I do agree with kind of a cop. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to comment, uh, Councillor Hearn, I took this report on knowing that council wanted to address the gap. I am not a tree person. I don't know diddly about trees outside of I planted some and some grew on my property and I planted some others and they died. I don't That's know. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'm doing, I'm trying, what I'm suggesting is that we're going to try and partner with people like Green Legacy who know about trees. Um, and hopefully they can steer us in the right direction about which trees are going to be successful, which ones make the most sense within the urban settings, all of those type of things because they have that expertise. Maybe they tell us to get lost. And if they do, then I'll come back to council and say, hey, my idea didn't work. Uh, we need to come up with another idea if we're serious about planting trees in the urban areas. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, I know that they, they probably will give you some advice. I mean, as someone who sits on the Rural Water Quality Committee, I mean, they do, people come with plans all the time and they come back with, you know, that tree's not going to grow there. So you need to, you know, move to another option, right? And I don't have that skill either. Um, but I did want to comment that back a number of years ago, I mean, we've been here for 19 years, and this is going way back, but um, the township did have a, a program for larger trees, and maybe Dan remembers, but I picked up, I think, three trees over that period of time that were like six feet tall. I, they must be 30, 30 feet tall now, the best trees ever. So... I love those three trees that I got from the township, but it talks as well, it talks about uh, two trees. Like, were you thinking two trees a year? Or are you thinking two trees in total, like two trees and that's it, you're done? Um, kind of depends maybe on the size of the property that you have. Like if you've got a big property, two is really nothing, so. Agreed, yeah, I, I think it's gonna be hard to make it strictly two. I was thinking two per year, but I also think 
yeah, that's yeah, depending upon the size of the property, they may be able to accommodate more than that. But we are talking about urban areas. Um, so I want to make we have and Councillor Hearn, you were the champion when we had the deputation. We have a very elaborate rural program in Wellington County and in Wellington North. We have tons of trees and tons of opportunities for people to plant trees in the rural areas. This was to identify what I was told was the urban gap around tree planting. So to answer the question, I don't think two is necessarily the limit, but I don't think it's going to be a lot more than that on on most of our uh, urban properties. It was just a question of clarification. It, uh, it, some lots can be can be large. I wasn't uh, approaching the rural area. We do have good programs. So, um, yeah, thank you. Okay. Other questions, comments? Dan, go ahead. It, it was a very thorough report, Mike. It was well, uh, well put <laughs> together. Lots of information. And we've known for a long time that you're not a tree guy. So you don't really have to elaborate on that, but I think it's a it's a work in progress. Uh, you know, I, I mean, we're going to have to kind of look at this from a whole bunch of different angles and and uh, see how it goes. But it it's a good start, and um, I'm glad to see that we're kind of you know it's on our radar and that we'll we'll start to move forward with it. So anyway, well done. Councillor Lake, are you suggesting I wasted a lot of paper with this report? Because oh, that was my. not, you know, that was no, not my not, No suggestion of that type whatsoever. <laughs> All electronic, Mike. It's only me that prints it out. Mike, when I started on council, we used a blackboard. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say smoke signals, Dan. <laughs> that was a year before. <laughs> Anyways, uh, is there any further discussion on this report? Okay, all those in favor? That's carried, thank you. We'll move on to 6C. This is the correspondence uh, from Mr. Don Nickel. And I'll read the recommendation that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North receive the correspondence dated August 9th, 2021, and petition from Don Nickel regarding London Road concerns. Uh, can I have a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Dan, seconded by Steve. And with that, I'll open the floor for discussion. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll speak on it. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Nickel has uh, put together a, a petition uh, you see the, the petition in your package. Um, he's asking council to consider um, London Road uh, concerns in the 2022 budget, and uh, I'm just asking that uh, that be that be done. Be considered, I guess, be considered that it be be pulled out here and, and considered in the 2022 budget. Okay. Thanks. We already Anybody have, else? We already have Sorry, the report. We already have the report from um, Matt uh, Public Works. I don't know if that needs to be updated moving into uh, budget process, but uh, if it does, then we could ask Matt to do that. Okay. Any other questions, comments in regard to this report or correspondence? I guess I should say. Okay, I'll call the motion. All those in favor then? That's carried, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to uh, notice of motion. Anybody have a notice of motion this evening? Seeing none, we'll move on to community group meeting program report. Anybody have anything they'd like to report there? Steve, go ahead. I'm sure uh, I'm probably jumping the gun, but uh, there is the BMX park, uh, Arthur Lyons BMX park that was mentioned earlier tonight. It's uh, There's a meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. Um, that's all I've got. Okay, thanks. Anybody else have anything to report this evening? Sherry, go ahead. 
So I just wanted to give Council a little bit of an update on the Aquatics uh, swag booth at the Sidewalk Sale event. Uh, there was um, some real interest with some of the items, but more interest and more questions about what was happening with the pool. And I just want to give the gals and guys that worked the booth uh, on that Saturday uh, a shout out because they did a really good job at answering uh, questions and uh, some of them weren't exactly sure what they could not couldn't share. So we had a, a briefing um, in the morning and lots of really positive feedback about uh, the new pool coming. So uh, thank you to Council for letting us have a loan to um, promote the pool. Okay. Thanks, Sherry. I, uh, I've got my mug or tumbler, I guess they call them, uh, at home uh, ready for use. And uh, Larissa was very enthusiastic with her uh, comments when I spoke to her about it. So uh, good, yeah. good ambassador for that program. Any other questions? Uh, Steve's showing his off. I don't have mind to show off. <laughs> <laughs> ben, go ahead. Yeah, I just uh, wanted to ask, did, every, did all the council get uh, his, uh, an invitation to the uh, hospital grand opening on September, September 8th, 2021? I got one, Dan, I know. I'll have to check, uh, Dan. All right. Okay. It's, um, it's September 8th at uh, 1 o'clock. Okay. So. Do you if have not, to RSVP, Dan? Or? I don't. Um, I'm not just 100% sure, Steve. Let me know if you didn't get one, and I'll forward you the information. If, if uh, you and uh, Sherry and Lisa can do that. Okay. Thank you. Any other uh, community group reports tonight? Okay. I'm not seeing any. I don't have any myself. Uh, we'll move on to bylaws. I have a recommendation here that bylaw number 81-21 and 82-21 be read a first, second, and third time and enacted. Can I get a mover and a seconder for that, please? Moved by Steve, seconded by Lisa. Any discussion on those? All those in favor? That's carried, thank you. And cultural moment, oh geez. I don't have that in front of me. Isn't that terrible? I'll see, especially when it, it. I'll see if I can pull it up, just a sec. Especially when it's the Toastmasters, I should have been prepared, shouldn't I? <laughs> Sorry. Are you uh, aren't you still a part of the Toastmasters? No, I haven't been an active member for a while. Okay. And page. I'm getting there just a sec. Uh, it's taking forever. Oh, I got it, Karen. Got it? Yep. So I'll, the Mount Forest Motivators Club was enthusiastically chartered on November 22nd, 2002, and entered the worldwide organization whose core values are integrity, respect, service, and excellence. It was once said, if you can't communicate, it's, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens. You can have all the brain power in the world, but you have to be able to transmit it. And the transmission is communication. Toastmasters offer people a safe place to relax, plan, and present a terrific speech. You learn to listen effectively, think on your feet, and speak confidently in a wide range of situations. A member chooses from 11 various pathways programs that best suit the individual's interests and goals at one's own pace. Presentation mastery, effective coaching, engaging humor, motivational strategies, persuasive influence, 
team collaboration, visionary communication, innovative planning, and more. Through our members' achievements and by having a minimum of 20 members, our club has obtained the highest accolade, President's Distinguished Status for 16 out of 19 years. We've had many eight-week speech craft programs for the public and have had numerous youth leadership programs with homeschoolers, the Optimists and Big Brothers, Big Sisters held in the library. Fun is important to learning. Each meeting has its own theme which gives directions to the toast, grammarian, word for the evening, and check those filler words. Jokester, inspirational quote. Each speech has a different purpose to achieve, organization, vocal variety, work with a group on how much, to, how to reach consensus, gestures, different communication styles, etc. Every speech is evaluated, accentuating what you excelled at, what you may want to work on, and what to challenge yourself with. The club theme in 2021 is Reach for the Stars, No Limits. Guests are welcome on Tuesdays at 7 p.m. For more information, please call, contact Carolyn Barron at barron at whiteman.ca. That's B-E-R-E-N at whiteman, W-I-G-H-T-M-A-N dot C-A. Cultural Moment was written for Wellington North Cultural Roundtable by Carolyn Barron, Pauline Brown, and Tammy Barrett from Toastmasters. To be continued. That's your cultural moment for this evening. Okay, with that said, I think the only thing we have left is our closed session. <clears throat> so for those of you still watching from uh, from your computer, we will be moving into closed session. And anything that comes out of our closed session will be published in the minutes after the meeting. So we've got a recommendation here to move into a closed session. Um, a second here. Okay, the recommendation is that the meeting is closed pursuant to Section 239.2 of the Municipal Act 2001, specifically for Item C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition of land by the municipality or local board. And so the recommendation is that the Council of the Corporation of the Township of Wellington North go into a meeting at 10.27 p.m. that is closed to the public under subsection 239.2 of the Municipal Act 2001 specifically for item C, a proposed or pending acquisition or disposition by the land or by, by the municipality or local board. Consider report CLK 2021-024 being a report on the proposed sale of an unopened road allowance and we'll review the closed session minutes of July 26th and rise and report from the closed meeting. So I gotta get a mover and a seconder to move into close, please. Moved by Steve, seconded by Sherry. All those in favor? We are enclosed. Thank you. Karen, do you need a minute to? I do. I just, I, mean, I just need to figure out how to keep Sherry on and get everybody else out. Okay. Sherry, you can still hear us, right? You're still on. Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I'm going to lock the meeting and stop recording.